Hey everybody, welcome. I'd like to now call the meeting to order. Could we please start with a roll call? Of course. Mayor Bagley? Here. Councilmember Christensen? Here. Councilmember Hidalgo Faring? Here. Councilmember Martin? Here. Councilmember Peck? Here. Councilmember Rodriguez? Here. Councilmember Waters? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum? All right. Uh, Susie, would you like to lead us in the pledge, please? Sure. Thanks. Ready? Uh -huh. okay. I, pledge I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, the flag of, the of the United States, States of America, America. and to the republic, to the republic for, which for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. All right. Just a quick reminder to the public, anyone wishing to provide public comment during the public invited to be heard section must watch the live stream of the meeting and call in only when I open the meeting for public comment. And so uh, you can't access the meeting at any other time, but that is told, you'll see a toll free number on the screen right now. Um, and so just watch for the instructions to be displayed um, when we get to the uh, public invited to be heard. You'll call in and then you'll be led into the room according to the last three or four digits in your phone number. So, all right, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the October 27th, 2020 regular session? So moved. Move approval. All right, I'll take that as a motion from Council Member Christensen and it was seconded by Council Member Waters. Any public, any discussion or debate? All right, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion to approve the minutes of October 27th, 2020 regular session is hereby approved unanimously. All right, any agenda revisions, submission of documents or motions to direct the city manager or staff to add agenda items. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, uh, we're all aware we're, we're about to do the final actions on the 2021 20, uh, budget. And we're all aware of the fact that in that budget, there are no adjustments in compensation for city employees, not to suggest that there might not be. Uh, what we've heard from Jim and Harold is that as we get into 2021, as they get a clear picture of what, what revenues might look like, uh, they might bring to us a recommendation to make salary adjustments for 2021. But as of now, uh, that's not in the budget. And we've heard about potential budget adjustments and that would, and that would Th those salary adjustments would be included in budget adjustments if they were to be proposed. So um, it seems to me that there, there are a number of ways of compensating staff. One of, the, one of those ways is with salary adjustments, cash compensation. The second is with time. And, and we talk about compensatory time, a way to compensate people with time. Um, and I think it will be a mistake if we don't, in anticipation of 2021, uh, ask Harold and, and his HR staff uh, to put together a, a plan of some kind uh, to use time as a way to compensate staff in 2021, um, maybe with salary adjustments if they occur, but certainly if that doesn't occur, that the use of time would be one way of compensating staff, which we haven't talked about. So um, I'm gonna move that we direct Harold uh, to, to put together a plan for the use of time for compensation Compensating staff in 2021 in anticipation of what other adjustments might occur uh, during the year. And you can bring that plan back to us if that's appropriate. In fact, that'll be the motion to bring a pl plan back to us for how to use time to compensate staff. Second. Second. Thank you, Polly the universal sign of, I cannot hear you. Yes, so uh, there was a motion made to direct staff to uh, proceed with an overall, I, the suggestion to basically um, grant city staff uh, an extra work day um, rather than uh, uh, in the event that there's no money to provide salary compensation for. Uh, that about it, right, Dr. Waters? Well, well the was, motion was a little broader than that. Yeah, what, what, uh, go I ahead and repeat the motion. A work day, it's not a plan. It might be more than one work day. Got it, got but, it. But to use, yeah. Okay, so motion is to direct staff to actually look at providing staff additional time off as part of their compensation package this year. 
that 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 the motion? That's the motion. All right. It was seconded by Councilmember Christensen. Um, seeing no further, Martin. Marcia. Oh, sorry. It was seconded by Councilmember Martin, and thirded by Councilmember Christensen. Um, and so, Councilmember Christensen. I think it should say a paid day off. Otherwise, a day off is you know. All right, a paid day off, as, as well as I assume the motion also means any other ideas that would be really good for staff that wouldn't cut into your budget. So um, we're willing to hear any and all ideas. Uh, Council Member Hidalgo Faring. So, and yeah, I had a conversation with Dale about this issue as well. And um, so, and it's not off the table then during the course of the year as um, numbers projections come in to reevaluate. So, you know, they're given the comp time, but then to reevaluate if um, pay, um, adjustments can be made on the salary schedule. That was a premise of the motion. So, yeah, I want to make sure that it's, um, that that's still in place. And yeah, that's, that's consistent with what we talk about in our budget message based on how we see performance mm -hmm. as we continue to move forward. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure if it's something that needed to be included writtenly in the um, in the proposal or in the motion. I thought it was in there, but I may have misheard it. Okay, go back and listen to the tape. What I said was, <laughs> in addition to potential cash compensation, not knowing what that's going to look like, that we authorize the management team to put together a plan to use time compensate staff with the understanding that, that there may be salary adjustments as well in 2021. So basically, I'm taking the motion to mean, Harold, you have the green light to discuss compensation in terms of time off, paid time off, salary increases. You've got our blessing. Enjoy. You are the executive over HR. Proceed. And we'll, bring, we'll bring something back to council. All right, and I believe that was a consensus. Anyone, anyone here not in agreement with that motion? All right, you've got a consensus vote mandate. Move forward, Councilmember Peck. I would. I think we should take a vote. All so. right, let's vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, it is still consensus unanimous, but now it's official. That's All right. right. All right, now it's official. Official. All right. Thanks, Dr. Waters. All right. Anything else, guys? Councilmember Lago Ferring. So I'd like to direct staff to get an update on um, and let me on what's going on, what's going to happen, or what where the status is on the um, North Main Street corridor. Um, the, you know there were a lot of plans in the works for in the comp plan. Um, you know I've oh, since COVID has started, I've tried to been trying to tried to keep connected with some of the businesses, just often ones that I frequent. But, um, you know, a lot of people have noticed that things are kind of happening south and downtown. And, you know, we have the Longmont Downtown Authority and that, and they, they manage, they oversee that and look at those pieces and they're doing a great job. But I want to make sure we don't forget about the North. All right, well, actually, I, 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 uh, Harold, can we just, I don't see you, Harold. Stop playing your games, eating your Twinkies. I want to like like I tell my kids. How how does the teacher know you're paying attention if I can't see you, Harold? No, the I'm kidding. You can go dark anytime you need to, Harold. No, but can we please just mayor's yeah. prerogative? Just put a five minute, just a five minute update on the next at the next council meeting or or whenever you can. Just what's going on with North Main because I do see a lot of there's construction going on. Why don't you just let us know what's going on? If, yep. Could you do that? Yeah. All right. I work with Joni and Aaron, and we can do that. All right, cool. Is that good enough, yeah. Council Member? Yeah, and that include any of the parks. I know we you we did some updates on Car Park, so that was and that meant a lot to a lot of the folks in the neighborhood who walk to that. Let's make park. sure let's let's include the car parks too, Harold. Let's, let's include the parks that are kind of getting neglected. So let's include them. <laughs> Appreciate that. All right, hey. cool. All right, anybody else? All right, let's go ahead then and move on to first or sorry, special uh, COVID update, Harold. We have a guest yeah, tonight, right? Yeah, we have several guests actually tonight on this. Um, and, and there's going to be a fair amount of information that we're going to go through. But the first guest, I'm going to ask Scott Cook to um, come on. And Scott has a special guest with him 
one of the things this is really attributed to is council's motion on the restaurant vouchers and how that's taken off. And so Scott's gonna give you all an update and talk about how that's being um, expanded based on uh, donations. So Scott, take it away. Sure, uh, thank you, Harold, and good evening, Mayor Bagley and City Council. As Harold said, uh, I'm Scott Cook, I'm the CEO of the Longmont Chamber. And I'm joined this evening by Ashley Sherman. She is with the uh, North Main Walmart store. Uh, so the Chamber has been working with Sandy Cedar and her staff on the Strongmont Restaurant Voucher Program. Uh, this is a program that was put forward by City Council to distribute tokens to families around the community. And then those tokens can be used at uh, the local restaurants. So this is a unique program um, that helps those, both those in the community, of course, and then our restaurants. Um, of course, both of, both of these groups have been heavily impacted by the pandemic. So of course, it's a win-win uh, for a lot of people. In the first round, we had just over 50 restaurants that participated. And in the second round, which we're working on now, um, we'll have just over 60 participating restaurants. Uh, we've only received positive feedback from the restaurants that uh, are participating. And in turn, they've let us know that um, they've received a lot of positive feedback from those that are using the tokens. Uh, many of the tokens have been used for special celebrations, for family nights out, or family nights in, because it is a pandemic, so many people pick up their food and uh, go home with it. Uh, and throughout this pandemic, Walmart has been a partner to the Chamber and in this community, so we wanted to let you know that. Walmart has assisted our small businesses with their game day marketplace, which they held at the uh, one, Highway 119 store. And then they've also contributed to uh, the Chamber Unity Funds the Community Fund, which we keep at the Community Foundation. All of those proceeds go to area nonprofits. And Walmart also loved the idea of the restaurant voucher program and has now donated 4,500 to the program. So this will help us reach more residents and more uh, restaurants. Uh, so I wanted to let you know of the success of the program so far and to let you know that we have one more partner in the program with Walmart. And so I'd like to, if uh, Ashley is still here with us, um, Ashley Sherman, I'd like her to be able to say a few words uh, from the North Walmart store. Ashley? Uh, thanks, Scott, and um, everyone. Uh, yeah, so we have um, really partnered with the Chamber to um, to donate our, you know, our money and our um, budgeted funds, and uh, being able to provide to the community is is something that is um, really core to me and to my management team and to Walmart as a whole. So, um, it's been a really good partnership. Like I said, with the chamber last year, it was the unity, um, and then this year, uh, you know, like Scott said, we um, have donated quite a bit to. Um, the those the Walmart strong uh, tokens for trying to support the food and all of the all the families that are in need. So we are here for the city of Longmont um, and any other needs that that you guys and everyone has. Great, thank you, Ashley. And I just wanted to again thank the city of Longmont. Thank you, City Council, for putting this program together. Um, if there's questions about the program and the Chamber's role in that, um, please let me know. We're, like I said, currently working on the second round, um, and that will go through uh, December 31st. So thank you, Harold. So Mayor Council, you started with, I believe it was 10,000 you all put into this. We put another 10,000 in from the CARES funding and then um, added the, I guess, 4,500, so 14,000. So. The idea for this program is definitely taken off and we hope that others are interested in um, continuing to support it and continue to grow the program. So um, thanks for the idea. Um, there's a hand up. Dr. Waters? Yeah, I just, I want to acknowledge, uh, this was Council Member Peck's proposal. And, and, I, and, and I don't know that, any, that I didn't have a sense of what a good idea it was at the time. It obviously was a, 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 a great idea. And I'm sitting here um, enjoying, even as I'm listening to a voice message I received from a constituent. We all get a lot of incoming correspondence 
voice messages and email, <clears throat> seldom do I get messages saying, thank you for, for what you've done. And I, I can take no credit in this, but Joan, I ought to forward this to you because uh, it is a constituent telling me how deeply grateful she is and, and how honored she felt in the establishment she went to to redeem that token. So good on you. Councilmember Christensen and then Councilmember Peck. Well, it's like, uh, looks like Polly has decided that she wasn't gonna speak. So uh, thank you for those kind words, uh, Councilman Waters, but this wasn't, this was council's idea. We do nothing other without a majority vote. So, uh, so thank everybody. <laughs> and I hope we can. Let, let it be, I'll take that as a point of order and everybody is hereby thanked. <laughs> Everyone is thanked. All right, uh, Harold, so, what, go ahead. So um, yeah, it was a great idea um, and, and, and a classic team effort with the city, you know, council member Peck coming up with the idea, council members coming in, Sandy and staff working with the chamber, also working with the Tinker Mill who made the tokens. And so you're really seeing multiple groups come together to work and that's how Longmont rolls as we do things as a community and coming together. So again, just another example of our great community. Um, that's good news to start off with. Um, definitely seeing a lot of changes in the COVID world. Um, the first thing that I wanna do, uh, Susan and I have actually been texting. We're gonna start off with a video. Um, so Eric, I believe you have the video. The governor, before you pull it up, Eric, I wanna talk about a couple of things. We received uh, some correspondence from DOLA. Also, I also received correspondence from the state and the governor's office. The governor's really, um, for the state employees, um, they've announced that state employees in level orange or level red counties will work remotely for the month of November and those except for those critical government functions who cannot perform job duties remotely. Um, and they're asking other local governments to join in on that. Excuse me, the coffee's um, talking back to me right now. Uh, so we're, we're going through that and evaluating the situation right now. And um, I wanted council to know that we, we are working to trim our numbers down as an organization to, to come into compliance with the, with the state orders and what they're asking local governments to do. But I also wanted to point out that this, this message from the governor to local governments. And so we're gonna be working with that over the next few days to see what we can do to achieve that. But that will still keep the facilities open that we're allowed to under the existing orders um, as we continue to move forward. Part of that is they also are putting together a, a robust uh, marketing package. And the first thing that they put out is a video from the state epidemiologist. So Erica, will you please play that video? Hi, I'm Dr. Rachel Hurley, Colorado state epidemiologist working on the COVID-19 response. COVID-19 has been spreading rapidly in our state. Cases and hospitalizations are going up almost as high as what we saw in March and April. The cases have grown so much that in the Denver area, about one in 145 people are currently contagious with COVID. Let me put that into perspective. In a week, if you come across 20 people a day, whether that's at work, on the bus, getting coffee, going to the store, or people in your neighborhood or friends, you will be in contact with someone who is contagious with COVID-19. Ask yourself, how many people do you interact with in a day and how can you reduce that? I wanna ask you to do three things starting today. For the rest of November, only interact with members of your household. Keep your distance, at least six feet at all times, and wear a mask. On behalf of the state of Colorado, thank you for stepping up and doing your part as we continue to do ours to protect you and your family. All right, Susan, can you um, join us? There you are. Okay. Thank you, Harold. Um, so I'm Susan Motika. I'm the Strategic Initiatives and Policy Director at Boulder County Public Health. Um, happy to be here today. Um, I wanted to give you some background before we go into the, uh, the slides that I've prepared for you. 
Um, as Harold indicated, the governor is really exhorting local governments, local public health agencies to do everything in their power at this time. He is really, um, you know, very reluctant to issue blanket stay at home orders at this time. Uh, the, we know that the cases are escalating in the state. They're escalating in virtually every region of Colorado. So, um, what we're being asked to do and what the governor governor's office really strongly asked Boulder County Public Health to do and the region, the Metro Denver Partnership for Health, is to think about ex some additional measures that could be put in place in the form of a county order. And he's asking the Metro directors to be doing this. So on Thursday morning at 8 a.m., the Board of Health will be meeting to consider an order that will have some further restrictions on indoor events, spectators at sporting events, restaurants, um, a strong, strong recommendation for working at home. Um, I don't want to get ahead of the specifics, which are still being um, negotiated and worked on. We've received tremendous feedback from the business community. Our hospitals have weighed in with uh, tremendous feedback, and I'll my slides are going to indicate and demonstrate that escalation as well. So it really is this very careful balancing act. Um, the state is really being clearer and clearer about two things in terms of guidance. One is the recommendation that anyone who can feasibly should return to working at home, and that is a strong recommendation. The other is that even though we are in the orange level, which as you know, um, allows up to 10 from no, no more than two households for personal gathering size, it is our strong recommendation, Jeff Zayak and CDPHE as well. That, and I, I'm sorry, I gotta log in again here, hold on. It is our very strong recommendation that people limit um, gatherings to their own family. And we know this is very difficult as Thanksgiving approaches, but um, we see this as very, very, very important to limit this surge that we're seeing all over. So um, those are two very, very strong recommendations. Why don't we turn to my slides now, if that's okay? Next slide, please. So you can see that our two-week cumulative incidence rate is 458.8 per 100,000. And that definitely puts us in the red level, which was 350. Next slide, please. Our two-week testing positivity rate is now 7.1%. And I'll have more information on that a little later in the slide deck. Next slide, please. Our hospital status is still in the green, but I will be providing some more information about um, escalating hospitalizations and impacts there as well. Next slide, please. So this is our five-day average number of new cases of COVID-19 among Boulder County residents. And this is just as of November 9th. Um, our five-day rolling average is about 146 cases per day through the end of 11-8, um, which is higher than any point except our recent CU surge. Next slide, please. Our next graph shows uh, Boulder County residents who've tested positive or considered probable by municipality. So here you can see that since October 1, Longmont, Longmont has the highest case rate per 100,000. Again, that's since 10-1-20. Um, in the past seven days, 41% of our new case of cases have resided in Boulder City and 36% of our new cases have resided in Longmont. Next slide, please. 
So, you know, about a month or six weeks ago when Jeff was presenting an RCU surge, you were seeing the highest rate among 18 to 22. They are still the highest rate, although you're, you can now see really clearly those other age groups, 23, 24, 25, 34, 35 to 44, um, really growing as well. Next slide, please. COVID-19 among children age zero to 17 years. So here you can see a tripling of the zero to four year um, age group and the five to nine year old age group. And I had a specific call preparing for this uh, presentation with, with the mitigation specialist for early childhood, Sarah Scully. And she wanted me to emphasize to you that health screenings occur uh, before either staff or students are allowed in, that people have to list their symptoms, answer if they've recently been quarantined, no one allowed is allowed in sick and people are isolated if they develop even one COVID symptom. And they, like the K through 12, are on the return to learn protocol. With this age group, as you know, it's extremely difficult to get two-year-olds to wear masks. So being very rigorous about those protocols is very important. I also spoke to Heather Crate, who was our, uh, is our K-12 policy expert, um, and she said that this protocol is still being used in the K-12 schools and that this is this online form that is uh, submitted through the Infinite Campus. Um, they are seeing the spread through activities, outside sports, clubs, family gatherings, not seeing spread in the cohorts, but they, as, as, as you know, they have to submit this electronic symptom tracker. The incidence of cases is not surprising given what we know about the community spread. Next slide, please. So here you can see the trend uh, two-week incidence of new COVID-19 cases. This is a slide that Jeff Zayak always presents uh, it just in our last two weeks. And if you just look at that right-hand side, it just sees that you can just see clearly that very significant escalation in those numbers among all age groups. And I won't give you like a statistical lecture here, but I will illustrate a bit. Uh, from zero to nine, a 353% increase, age 75 plus, a 172% increase, 18 to 22, a 168% increase. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a slide you, you've seen before, but this is giving us information about race, Hispanic origin, and how those cases look. We know that Boulder County, 13.8% of the population is Latino. We know that 31.8% um, of COVID cases come from that community and 42.7% of all hospitalizations. And in the past seven days, 51.8% of our cases or 331 cases have been among Hispanic Latinx community. And 47.7% of our cases, or 305 cases, have been among white, non-Hispanic. Um, I will just wanna add to this data slide that we're embarking on a very comprehensive COVID plan with which Lexi Nolan, our new deputy director, is working on. It will have a significant, um, focus on the Latinx and other priority populations. And we have already been collaborating with Longmont, with Harold, with team on this. Um, we've hired Nick Robles, who is a long, long time Longmont resident to be our bilingual resource coordinator. So I would just expect a lot of activity and collaboration as we learn from your already very um, successful efforts and we collaborate further on this. Next slide, please. So next we see a summary of COVID testing among Boulder County residents. Um, the number of PCR tests conducted 
117,326. Our five-day average percentage of tests that are positive, 8%. As you know, the metric for being in a safe zone is 5%. So that is significantly higher than the 5% number we would like to see. And our five-day average uh, on this is 4.7%. Next slide, please. So you can look at our five-day rolling average of COVID PCR tests. This is a very illustrative. As I said, the rolling average is 8%. This has been increasing over the past five weeks and it surpassed the level it was during the height of the young adult surge at CU in September. Next slide, please. Hospitalizations in Boulder County. This graph really starkly illustrates that upward, very, very strong upward trajectory. As of November 9, 86 people are hospitalized in Boulder County for confirmed COVID. Next slide, please. Um, we're, we're asked at times, how does this look compared to Colorado? So currently we're at 1,174 people hospitalized for confirmed COVID across Colorado, and that's compared to 755 people only a week ago. This is the highest uh, COVID hospitalization number we've ever had in Colorado. Um, I would also point out that there have been 18 deaths from COVID in Boulder County since October 1. Next slide, please. And these are our um, resources that we always provide in our presentations uh, that provides far more data and far more information. Um, I also have a 59 slide slide deck, which Harold, I'm happy to send for people that would like much more in-depth, happy to send that to you. Um, I wanted to address, Harold, would that be, or, or Mayor, would it be appropriate for me to address some of the questions that came in in advance now, or would you like me to wait on that? Um, what questions came in in advance? From who, Harold. council members? Yes. Harold. Yeah, go ahead Harold. and address them now, that's fine. Okay, I will do my best on that. Um, so one question was, what is considered an outbreak? And just to remind you all, it's two or more cases with a common exposure within a 14-day period. Um, next question, people have seen places where there are two or more cases in a facility or building that are not categorized as an outbreak. Why is that? I spoke to our chief epidemiologist about this tonight, and she says, um, you know, there are other conditions that can affect us. For example, um, it didn't happen within a 14 day period that people work in Boulder County, but reside elsewhere. We're dependent on the other county, that test results can be delayed, that there can be reporting lags. So as a general rule, that definition I gave you is correct and applied, but there are some variations that she indicated. So question about, we're going the education route, clarifying the expectation of masking and social distancing. Is it masking, is it social distancing, or must it be both? Uh, Jeff Zak and I spoke about this yesterday and he wanted me to urge that in the strongest possible terms, this must be a continued combination. And as Dr. Hurley, he, uh, indicated tonight in, in what Harold showed the video, we've got to have masking, we've got to have social distancing, and we've got to have hand washing. We've got to have this constant um, combination in play. And that we are not actually looking at measures like how safe are you if there's only a mask? How safe are you if there's social distancing, but not a mask. We do not have data on this. And part of the emphasis, uh, whether it's the CDC or State Health Department or us, is that um, integral combination of those factors. So there question two about um, gyms. So if we're limiting ourselves right now under orange to uh, 10 people and two households, and gyms seeming to have more 
latitude here. Um, gyms are under, and I just, I pulled up the dial on this one. Hang on a minute, please. Gyms and fitness centers are at 25% capacity, 25 indoors or outdoor groups less than 10. Um, so what Jeff wanted me to emphasize here is that they are, and Trina Ruland, actually, our county attorney, gyms are highly regulated. They've got licenses. They're checked on. They have these requirements. Um, as opposed to our personal gatherings with which, you know, nobody's going to break into our house, so to speak, at Thanksgiving and examine our per our gatherings. You know, we're on an honor system with our gatherings, but gyms are really subject to that licensure requirement. Um, I wanted to also reference, and I asked that this be sent to all of you, it's guidance document from CDPHE called in-person learning in the time of COVID. Because another question that can't that came in had to do with it seems as though schools are allowed other kinds of latitude. Why is that? So if you take a look at that document that I sent at your convenience, it really talks about CDPHE analyzing K through 12 outbreak case distribution guidance, or not guidance, the actual results. And since March in K through five, they found 23 outbreaks, 55 cases, 23 students with COVID. Um, and in the middle schools, 10 outbreaks, 32 cases, 20 student cases. So in balancing, in balancing the need for students to be in school, to benefit from that in a social, emotional, as well as educational sense, and also lower income students um, benefiting as well, they really looked into this guidance and literature on that point. So I would urge you to read that document at your convenience if you haven't already. Um, so another point that's really key is People who are outdoors have 20 times less chance of getting COVID when they're outside as opposed to when they're indoors. So bear that in mind as we're going through some tough winter times, right, with gathering size. Um, so in terms of events and parsing, you know, what kind of events, whether it's a protest, a sports, rally, big family gathering. Um, what Jeff has said consistently, we have one in 100 people being infected and that gatherings, you have a first amendment right. It's not about a right to gather. It's about what's judicious, what's in your health interest, what's in our community's health interests. And that severely restricting to the greatest extent we can gatherings are very, very important. So another question was, is there a trigger? What's the trigger for Boulder County Public Health to re require schools to go remote when rates go up? So right now under orange, there is not a trigger, but there is this continued examination of data by the school districts, by us, uh, really looking closely and carefully at data and having a, a very collaborative and informed process. But there isn't, there isn't a specific numeric trigger right now. I think we had a question about the orange level and that, that classrooms cannot do targeted quarantine anymore. And that is true. Um, districts are well aware of it. Jeff, the uh, local public health directors are well aware of this and we are advocating with the schools, with the uh, CDPHE on that point. Um, I think that was about all the questions I had, Harold. Councilmember Peck, and then we'll go with Councilmember Hidalgo Fair. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Susan, thank you for that. That was very detailed um, and in interesting. Um, I have a question about uh, post, post COVID. Is there any data being collected on people who have experienced the virus, gone through it, and then passed it, I'm sorry, and then tested negative after but they're still experiencing symptoms, even though they have the antigens now. And uh, are we doing any follow-up on that? Any uh, data collection on 
Are we still having the fog brain? Are we still not being able to eat, uh, taste, um, smell? And how long does that last? Because I think that is information that needs to be put out with these reports as well. Because people seem to think that if they get it, they get it. But we don't know what the long lasting effects of this are or how long those symptoms can last after you've tested negative. So um, are we collecting any of that data? Um, I, I would just say from my office, um, um, Councilwoman Peck, that we are so focused on the surge of cases, the case investigation, the contact tracing, so focused on those core epidemiology functions and the communications aspect and the policy aspects that we haven't devoted time to that yet. Okay. Um, nor am I aware, but this is an excellent question, nor am I aware of the Colorado School of Public Health doing it or CDPHE. I think that, you know, we keep seeing these waves yeah. and surges that we have to really try to competently address, but that is a very, very critical question that I will just put to the uh, Metro Directors okay. meeting and to uh, Colorado School of Public Health and CDPHE. Okay. Well, I think the CDC's the CDC's doing some work on that, and um, and so it you know so they go most common reported long term symptoms fatigue shortness of breath cough joint pain chest pain um, other reported symptoms difficult with thinking and concentration depression muscle pain headache intermittent fever fast beating or pounding heart and then more serious long term is cardiovascular inflammation of the heart muscle, respiratory lung function anomalies, abnormalities um, on the renal side, acute kidney injury, um, dermatologic rash, hair loss, neurological smell, taste problems, sleep issues, difficulty with concentration, memory problems, and then on the psychiatric side, depression, anxiety, and changes in mood. So that's what they're hearing. And I think Everybody, I think that's really where it's, it's happening is, is within the CDC um, in terms of that. And they'll be working with the schools of health to, to examine that in more detail. Yeah, I would agree. The literature is indicating that, and that's in the topical literature, more popular literature as well. What Harold talked about, we haven't started studying that, but it is a lot of people are going to be studying it because COVID COVID repercussions, whether they're economic or, you know, physical impacts, they're going to be with us a long time. All right. Anything else, Susan? Um, no, I don't have anything further. All right. Councilmember Lago Fairing. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. So one of them would be um, in regard to the, the masking and social distancing and washing of the hands. So would it be a considered a violation of the workplace to, if not all three are occurring indoors? Um, we don't, there is not a specific order on hand washing. Mm -hmm. um, and the masking. And masking. Yeah, and the, there are specific, um, there are specific rules on what offices can do with masking and that you need to be wearing a mask um, when you're in a hallway. Um, you need to be maintaining that six foot distance. Mm -hmm. And this is something that the county has really grappled with and our county attorneys have grappled with uh, because sometimes people have really big offices and it does, you know, it, it doesn't seem to make sense to people, but um, I think because of the very close, um, the need to have that combination of factors that mm -hmm. that, that has been required and there is that specific masking order. Okay. So we've had, to, we've had to deal with that in our organization. So the governor's masking order requires a mask indoors. Generally what uh, the county attorneys and our attorneys, unless you're in an office that has four walls and a door, and you're not in there with someone else. Um, and we've even gotten to the level of cubicles, all cubicles, short cubicles. Do they have doors, those types of issues? 
generally the room of, the rule of thumb that we're using is if you're in a building, you wear it. If you're with somebody else, based on the, the, the order that's been issued, we're a little bit different outside because of Boulder County's masking order. That's why they're both in play. They also require one outside if you can't adequately social distance. And that's not the same in other places. Mm -hmm. So Harold, then I have a question for you in, um, so like common spaces, like the, the lounge, the staff lounge, um, are people able to eat inside? It's, we're having that very conversation right now. And, um, and so basically we're also looking at the restaurant guidance in terms of how they can eat in the lounges. But um, we had that conversation among my team and, and we're just actually encouraging people to eat in their offices and, and where they aren't next to someone else because um, it does, when you start having those exposures, it creates staffing issues on our part. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing now. And so, and um, through contact tracing, has anything throughout the county been brought back to um, these outbreaks occurred in the staff lounge or in common eating spaces like that? Not necessarily restaurants, but in places of business, um, offices. So maybe Susan and I tag team this. Um, I think what, what I've been briefed on in our administrator's call Mm -hmm. is that if you really look at what's generating the bulk of the cases right now, and I think this is an important message for the community, it really is in the social gatherings. Um, it, you know, when, <clears throat> when they were doing the, the contact tracing, and, and that's another conversation we're having just mm -hmm. because of the volume of cases. It's different today than it was, you know, a few weeks ago. But what they're finding is it is coming out of the social gatherings more than it is out of restaurants, out of business units. Okay. And Absolutely. Then, uh, I was just, may I just add there? Yes. Yeah, it's just that is what we hear consistently um, <clears throat> through the Metro directors from the Colorado Health Department that social gatherings are absolutely the number one source. And that is why the recommendation about voluntarily limiting our gathering sizes even below what the orange level requires is being strongly recommended now. Okay, um, and then the other thing was, um, oh, around the outbreaks. So, you know, and I'm gonna, all full disclosure, I'm a teacher in the school district and the school district is the largest employer of the city of Longmont. So how the operations are handled there affect our community. It impacts our constituents, our ability to function as a city. So, you know, I wanna make sure that, you know, as I'm advocating for whatever piece in my union capacity, that I'm also not doing anything or supporting anything that's going to damage or hurt the city and our constituents and the, the health and well being of our, of our residents. Um, so one of the things going back to the outbreak, so we've had cases where there are two or more in a building, but they're not considered an outbreak. And the message that's being told, and, you know, and, and it kind of changes. And I think that it could be that the individuals who are sharing the information are not fully understanding. So they're, they're putting in their own interpretation or are the guidelines changing throughout? Because early on, I mean, we had this metric where we were looking at, and I can't find it anywhere on the website. There's a new metric description that has, you know, the threshold is totally different or higher if, to move to fully remote than it was here, than what we discussed back in September. So um, the, out, the message on outbreaks is that if they did not come from, so if you had two in a building, if one came from one out source and the other one came from another source, that that's not considered an outbreak. And I wanna know if that's true or not. Well, it's that definition of two or more cases with a common exposure. So I guess it, it's very it dependent upon these facts, like how close were those people? 
did they have a common exposure? And as Carol Hellwood said, within a 14 day period, perhaps it didn't happen within a 14 day period. You know, perhaps a person who was exposed uh, worked in Boulder County, but lived somewhere else. And I'm, I'm not trying to just repeat those things. I think that I would inquire with the people that are making decisions about that, what criteria, what, what specific facts, what and specific I, facts are governing? Because I you. think that that's what, um, the other thing Carol said is that the state is looking, Councilwoman, at some revised definitions and guidance on these outbreaks. I mean, obviously the questions you're asking are, you know, they're, they're being heard by the state of Colorado, not just from Longmont, and that they're looking at some additional guidance on this. So I think we'll have more information to uh, give to Harold and give to you soon. But that's the best I can say right now is that collecting those specific I'm, facts. I'm answering the right, I'm asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's so it is really probing. And yes. I want to make sure that I'm probing the right people too. And that yes. would be <laughs> All right. Well, and, and to Susan's point, in the last admin call I had, many of those questions were echoed by many other communities, mm -hmm. um, putting those same questions in the in the mix. And so I know Chris. Um, how do you Mescheck? say Chris's Meschek? Meschek from, from yeah, from the the interim city manager in Boulder mm -hmm. said, "Yeah, I'm getting the same questions." So we're all getting them, and we're all trying to get those same answers. Okay. And then how involved is the county in doing the contact tracing for Boulder Valley, for us, um, when we, we have uh, um, cases? Well, where, when there are outbreaks, the uh, epidemiology office of our office is notified mm -hmm. and they're taking their appropriate measures and steps. Okay. I was under the impression that we were having a hard time keeping up with the contact tracing now. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. That is absolutely correct. Um, Carol Helwig has indicated that there are really hundreds of cases right now. This is just based on those numbers I gave you, that things are really, really escalating. We are doing our best to add staff, mm -hmm. to volunteer other staff, to be looking at different ways to do this. Harold, did you want to add? Yeah, so that to, to that point, um, based on the volume of cases, they are having um, struggles with the contact tracing. I know in the admin calls, several people were talking about what can we do to help hire positions. I've had conversations with my team um, when we talked about this issue. Um, give you a sense, I meet Tuesday, Thursday with my full team. We have calls with other administrators. I have another admin call. We've had conversations internally about how can we repurpose our staff mm -hmm. to assist the county in the contact tracing function, at least at a basic level so we can communicate with people immediately, talk to them quickly about who are you around, what were you were, what are you doing so we can try to stay on top of this, um, all within the framework of we're in community spread, but still how do we collectively staff that to support our county partners? And I'll touch on that in terms of conversations I've been having with Lexi once okay. Susan's finished. And a while ago, um, when Jeff presented his slides, he had a slide on there about uh, individual person-to-person -person cases, there are cases that were because it was individual, and then others that were community spread. Does that seem familiar to anybody? Did, was I like imagining it? <laughs> How come I haven't, I would like to see that a slide of that again. To I'd be of, delighted. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 that's, no, that would be. I will look through our slide deck of 59. I was really trying to kind of capture a story and a framework for you because our whole slide deck is really, really big, but I will look for that slide for you. But mm -hmm. I think that, um, and, and we've done some tinkering. We got some, we got a lot of feedback and we've done some tinkering and labeling and um, in, more in-depth surveillance data work, frankly, with the slides. But I know that what it is indicating is that the community spread, one in 100 people mm -hmm. are 
infected with COVID, whether they're asymptomatic or symptomatic. So I think that Jeff may have been making that case, sort of showing a trend that yeah. was growing, but it wasn't as strong as it is today. Today, it is very strong that we have community spread. Nobody doubts that. Okay. And that the person to person that we saw in March, April, and May, and I am re remembering that slide right now, that was much more relevant. Uh -huh. <laughs> in the early part, COVID-1. Yes, yes. And so, and you had asked, you had asked if anybody was interested in, in a copy of the slide deck or emailing it. Um, yeah, I am interested. I, I like data. <laughs> so I can so. tell that, no problem. I'll, I'll forward that to Harold. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I think that was all. And if not, I'll email Harold or I'll email you. So <laughs> thank you. You bet. I guess the um, um, one something I just to throw out, uh, Dr. Dr. Waters, go ahead. You first. Your arm's getting tired. Go ahead, Doc. You know, it, it, interesting here. I just I, so go I, ahead. I, since you deferred, Susan, thanks for your, your for the information. I, could you could you help me reconcile in my mind what what I think I saw you present, and I'm not certain what slide number it is for uh, the cohorts of zero to five. Uh, six to twelve, whatever those age cohorts were, and the uh, and the numbers that have increased uh, over the the two reporting periods, because those numbers, if I recall what I saw, are hard to reconcile with the numbers in the document you sent on teaching in person. And I'm just wondering what I'm not understanding in terms of the the, the discrepancy between what you presented and the rates of infection now versus what I'm seeing in this document. Yeah, and I think that, um, and I can have our epidemiologists look into the actual math analysis on this, but I would just say, and I should have said this at the beginning, that the actual numbers are still relatively small. For example, in the two week period of October 12 to October 25, it's eight. So we're not looking at those vast numbers that we see with CU and other age groups. And in um, October 26 through 11 to 8, I'm uh, sorry, November 8, um, a count of 25. So what age, what think, age group would that be? I'm sorry, zero that was zero four. to four. Yep, that was zero to four. And so, so that's something the, that we got, we have gotten feedback, good feedback on the data, make sure, and forgive me for not doing that. It's like, you can triple and people can think, well, is that 400? Oh my God, it tripled. But when you can see it, it was eight. Go ahead. Um, give me the, 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 is it the next cohort is five to what? Five to nine. Give me those numbers. Certainly. Uh, so in... What's on October the screen now, Susan? To October, yeah, thanks. October 12 to October 25, 13, and then 52 from October 26 to November 8. Got it. So, Susan, um, are these infections? These are confirmed. So, this is COVID, people that have con kids that have confirmed COVID. And I think I'm understanding. Um, your question about the data that I presented, you know, saying, let's all take a look at that CDPHE report, that that is based on earlier, earlier data, certainly than the October 26 through 11-8. That no, is my guess on that. No, it's not. It's, it's dated November 2020. And the numbers are substantially smaller than what you're showing us right now. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to reconcile. And it goes back, I think, a little bit to the concerns that Council Member Hidalgo Faring was sharing about consistency and clarity and meaning, right, of the data. Um, because because the, whoever put together the page you sent to us about teaching in person, the data in that report are, are an approximation of the data that you just shared just in Boulder County. Mm -hmm. and I, and I, how do we reconcile that discrepancy is my question. Well, why, is, uh, why is it so different? And okay. it's not because because one's in October, one's in November, it's going up in November. These numbers yeah. should be higher than what you presented, not lower. 
Yeah, and I think what, what I'll do is have our chief epidemiologist work with me on that to get you an answer because that's quite frankly, uh, and, and you know, this, this report from CDPHE literally just came out and these numbers we've got yesterday from our, the COVID children case count, I'll have our epidemiologists and CDPHE really reconcile this and have an answer for you. Well, and, and, I'll, and I'll be quiet, but part of, oh, that's good. part of my concern in, in terms of understanding the, the reasons for the discrepancy, what it is, the broader concern is um, the last thing we want to do is trot data out that we, that we can't verify, we can't defend, or we can't explain. Because for those who want to question the data, um, it just gives them a, a, a reason to question the data. And I'm not, I'm not questioning what we got from you. I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident that I can rely on those data. It's, it's the document from CDPHE on teaching in person and you know, what those differences are. So yeah. um, I, we'll I get to the, I promise you, we'll get to the bottom of it. And our epidemiologists will talk to the epidemiology folks at CDPHE who did this analysis um, which I think the general correct, what we've seen in trends across the country in reading about this is that there is less case incidence in that younger population. So um, we'll square up those numbers though. All right, well, <laughs> uh, if, if the data on teaching in person is as dramatically understated as it looks like it is, that ought to be a concern on the part of a whole bunch of folks, parents, educators, us. So um, getting that reconciled soon was going to be really helpful. Absolutely. And, and, and reconciled, reconciled may not mean, reconciled means in my mind, providing the explanation and the analysis about the sources, comparing them and those traditional, that traditional sort of epidemiology analysis of where it comes from and how it was calculated. That's what I'm committing to. Yeah, part of what we can tell you, the numbers that she gave you are produced in turn, so the 8 to 25, 13 to 52, that's our local numbers and that's what's produced by Boulder yeah. County Health. We can understand that. We will yeah. need to reach out to CDPHE to have them reconcile that for us. Harold, it looks to me like in the in the document that was forwarded to us, there, this is a statewide take. I mean, they're, 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 what's correct. The That's what I'm saying. Numbers it's CDPG. Of schools, numbers of teachers, numbers of of uh, students statewide. Yes. And then yes, a, you're right. a number, not a percentage, a number of cases. For example, of K K five, reporting 23 students statewide. I mean, that just, it doesn't, it's like hard to understand where this came from. Yeah. So that's, that's the concern. Understand you completely. Harold, can you, I mean, uh, we, I don't want to debate this. I mean, we, if, unless people are like, absolutely not. Going back to the first thing that was presented tonight was a very, I think, articulate, artic, articulate, articulate, and uh, a succinct message conveyed by Colorado's head epidemiologist, in the governor's office. Um, part of the problem we're dealing with here is that you've got left versus right ways of thinking. Um, I do think that everyone could, I mean, I think everyone would agree that we need to do the things that were asked of us. Um, and so uh, I'd, I'm almost inclined to ask city staff to write up a resolution basically saying we encourage everyone for the following reasons to do these things and then basically let city of Longmont and our citizens and constituents know that we endorse what the governor's office just said because I don't think anyone's going to watch that video and I don't think the message is going to get out and I think that if we pass a law or we threaten you're going to have half of the people say no way um, and you're going to I just think that I think the message needs to get out to folks that we need to stay six feet apart wear our masks and um and uh, what was the other thing? Wear six feet apart, wear our masks. Oh, and, and to the extent stay possible, with your family limit, unit. Stay, yeah, stay within your family unit. And so I think that that's something that we should convey. So, so yeah, and, and to that point, um, you know, just internally, I'll tell you what we're dealing with. We, we've had to deal with masking issues. Um, 
And, and for me, it's, it's a pretty simple equation. So, but I think, I think if we just ask people and just pass along the message that the governor right. is asking us to, I just think that. Uh, no, I agree with you. Okay. I agree All with right. you because to let you know how it impacts it, and I'm just giving you an example as an organization. If I'm next to you, mm -hmm. and we had one of these issues where someone tested positive, but guess what? Everyone was socially distanced and everyone was wearing the mask. And, and, and so when you look at it, we don't have to quarantine Damn. people because right. they're there. And so we continue providing the services we're providing to our community. Uh, just doing, doing, create, drafting a resolution. And I think you can't, I mean, to avoid the whole constitutional versus just right. all those arguments and just say, let's do this, please. Correct. And I think I need to update you on some other things too. All right. So Susan, thank you so much. We appreciate you. All right. I'll be back in touch on a range of issues. All Thank right. you so much tonight. Bye-bye. Yeah, All right, Harold. So some other issues going on. So we are also partnering with Boulder County Health, and Susan can stay on during this in case I missed something. So we have opened the testing location at the fairgrounds. Dan Eamon and our emergency management team, they're working with them uh, to assist in that operation. It's also creating more testing opportunities. Also, as, as we look at the data and see where the cases are coming in the community, um, I do have access to see a more focused data set. Um, I can't share that because of um, any number of privacy issues. And so we're also working with our cultural brokers um, to have pop-up testing sites at different locations in our community based on where we're seeing um, a number of tests, a number of where we're seeing issues within our community. So we are going to work with Lexi um, Nolan, I believe it's Nolan, um, and really working those issues on the testing side. But then as we look at the mitigation approach to the mayor's suggestion about a resolution, I think that's really important because um, how we work within neighborhoods and how we communicate with neighbor in neighborhoods is going to be incredibly important. And then at the same time, I've talked to my team about working with Jessica and Kimberly and all of our economic development partners about really engaging um, our business owners here because I wanna point something out that Susan said at the beginning, no one wants to go back to stay at home. And notice she said that the governor's not looking at doing this. It's not where anyone wants to go. And, and to do that, we have to do the things that the mayor just indicated wear a mask, social distance, and stay within our family units and really follow those guidelines. And I think those are incredibly important messages because the data is telling us where we're seeing the case growth and we are seeing the hospitalization starting to increase in, in, our, in our community. And what we know is if we do those things, we can move in the opposite direction. And so we will prepare the resolution um, and get that message out. And Harold, I think that part of the message I think that needs to be conveyed is it doesn't matter if the governor shuts us down or not. If your entire office staff gets sick, it doesn't matter. So, I mean, the getting people to, I mean, yeah, just getting people to voluntarily comply, I think is the key here. Well, that's the key. So, We're struggling with that right now in terms of when somebody's kid gets it and whether they need a quarantine and then how does that affect operations? And I was on the phone for an hour before the meeting talking about issues. And it really is about if your entire staff gets sick, what are you going to do? And, and that's the issue that I think that's a good point, Mayor. And so we will, we will focus on that. All right. Cool. Thanks. We'll write it up and we'll deal with it. All right. There you Thank go. you. Thank All you. Right. Anything else? All right, then let's go ahead and take a five minute break. And uh, actually let's shoot for three, but we'll probably take five. And uh, let's wait for public invited to be heard to go ahead and call in. So we're gonna go ahead and do first call public invited to be heard. And we're gonna take a five minute break while everybody calls in and gets in the queue. At the end of that five minute break, we will stop taking people into the queue once we're all back and, and make sure that the calls are done. So see you in a little bit.
Hi, folks. This is your opportunity to call in for public invited to be heard. When you do call in, please remember to mute the live stream that you're watching and listen for the instructions on your telephone. Um, once you're admitted into the meeting, we will call on you by the last three digits of your telephone number. At that point, you'll be able to unmute yourself, state your name and address for the record, and then you will have three minutes for public comment. So please go ahead, use the toll-free number and enter the meeting ID when you're prompted, and we will um, be back in touch with you in a few minutes. Hi, folks. Thank you for joining us. Um, as we admit folks into the meeting for public comment, please remember to mute your live stream and listen for the instructions on your telephone. When it's time for you to speak, I'll call you by the last three digits of your telephone number, at which time you should be able to unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record, and then you will have three minutes. I think we have just a couple more minutes to go.
All right, who's back? What a good looking crew. All right, Mayor, it looks like we have about eight folks for public invited to be heard whenever you're ready. All right, let's go ahead and start them. All right, for the caller ending in 017, you should be able to unmute yourself, state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Caller 017. All right, let's try caller 424. Caller 424, are you able to unmute yourself and state your name and address? Oh. Any chance that we might be having a problem? It looks like they unmuted, but um, caller 424, we're not able to hear you. Try hitting star six on your phone and then star six again to mute and unmute. I heard him hit it. Mm hmm Let's say we're, we'll come back to him, Erica. Sure. Caller 424, we'll come back to you. We're going to move on to 474. Caller 474, are you able to unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record? Yes, here I am. Can you hear me? We can, loud and clear. Thank you. Yeah, hi. good evening. My name is Ethan Chutko, 156 11th Avenue. I'm calling in to just comment on the RV ordinance. I was involved with um, the first update to that code that was passed uh, and discussed at length by this group here three years ago. And um, at the time, it was a significant issue. What caused us to be become involved with the conversation was an RV or a series of RVs that parked in front of our residence for over a month, um, couple, uh, several months in one instance. And um, the code that was developed was developed, I'm not going to say in haste, but it was definitely developed uh, to address an issue that was very concerning to the public and needed immediate attention. And I remember this group in particular stating that we needed action over complacency while admittedly not knowing the full ramifications of um, what this code would mean or a code adjustment would mean. And so it was admittedly imperfect, but as uh, Harold Dominguez said earlier this evening, that's how Longmont rolls. We're act acting as a community, which I appreciate. Um, but 
I think uh, as time has continued to show us that this code is not uh, completely perfect, it's uh, it's been effective in giving code enforcement an opportunity to move vehicles along and uh, limit the dwelling time in any one and imposition in any, any one neighborhood for a certain amount of time. It's not as intended. 48 hours was the intention. After you look at uh, the time it takes to report things and then have code enforcement then come and enforce it, et cetera, we're looking at more about a week before um, people are really forced to move along. And I think we're recognizing that it's time for an update and refinement of this code. And uh, here we are. So I appreciate the group, the council looking at this issue. I would just like to say that not taking action on this is not an option. I think the time is now to take action. Um, and this isn't really not about keeping up with the Joneses and our neighbors and what other cities and municipalities are doing, but rather this is just about doing right by the citizens and taxpayers of Longmont. And I implore you to, even though I don't have the answers here, that's why you guys get paid the big bucks, right? Um, but uh, figure out some logical next steps and, and take some action. So I'll leave my comments at that, but I appreciate that. All right, th thank uh, you, you'll sir. You'll be moving forward with it. Appreciate it. Okay, next caller. Oops, just a sec here. All right, caller 424, were you able to unmute yourself? Caller 424? Can you state your name and address for the record? Uh, hi, my name is Dan Olson. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. I live at 1674 Brown Court in Longmont. I'm calling about the RV ordinance as well. And I emailed you all just a few hours ago and there is some confusion about whether owners like me of a trailer can park out front for 48 hours prior to a trip. I looked through the ordinance. It's not obvious, but I'm not a lawyer. So uh, in any case, I bring my camper trailer home from the storage unit park it out front, load and unload it, but part of loading is charging the batteries and cooling the refrigerator, and that's more than just a couple of hours. So I'm hoping that in the final ordinance, there is some provision for parking out front for overnight at least, maybe two nights, uh, so that we can cool off the fridge, get the batteries charged, load her up, and off we go. Uh, appreciate you guys working on this. I do think an ordinance update is needed for the other reasons, the whole sleeper vehicle part, but I'm hoping you'll protect the us owners who don't park out front all of the time just when we're ready to get going. Thanks so much for your help. Appreciate all your work on this. Thanks, Dan. All right, next. All right, caller 488, you should be able to unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my name is Scott Cunningham. I'm uh, calling in on the AMI uh, smart meter issue. I practice integrative internal medicine, as I think that you all probably know, and I've helped many of my patients recover from the adverse health effects of the same uh, radio frequency radiation emitted by the wireless version of the AMI smart meter presently under review. So I'm going to uh, focus my comments this evening on clarifying material covered during the recent study session by um, uh, Boulder County's air quality coordinator. I understand how daunting the biological literature on radio frequency radiation health effects can, can be. As a practicing clinician, I've wrestled with it myself. However, my goal in the next couple of minutes is to appeal directly to the literature rather than relying on statements 
from so-called experts who may or may not have actually read the current scientific literature about the harms of wireless radiation. I'll start with this particular speaker's statement that non-ionizing radiation, including that used by the wireless AMI smart meters, can't cause tissue damage at the low levels of power used by those devices. The scientific literature, however, paints a much different picture. We have multiple peer-reviewed studies, both animal and human, showing tissue damage, including breakage of DNA. In fact, I've sent links uh, to those studies to the council for your review. Careful, uh, careful review of the same literature also debunks the tired theory that only the thermal effects of radio frequency radiation are relevant to biological systems. Let's, let's apply this rich body of scientific literature to the daily life of you and I. The fact that we're, uh, and I quote, every second of every day exposed to radiation from a number of different sources, end quote, does not mean that we shouldn't work to reduce that scientifically proven hazard to our health. Did we use that reasoning with lead paint or with the toxic haze flowing out of factory smokestacks? No, we didn't. Here's another one. Just because many are unknowingly exposed to a man-made source of radiation doesn't lessen its negative biological impact. I'll leave you with a question to ponder. Knowing what we now know about wireless radiation, is it even ethical to impose it upon our population. Thank you very much. That was exactly three minutes. That was spot on. Thank you. All right, next caller. Caller 499. 499, you should be able to unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, this is Doe Kelly of Barberry Drive. And I am one of the self-avowed EMF canaries in the coal mine. You've heard me speak of this, living within the local Longmont community. I attended the Longmont City Council AMI and Smart Meter study session on October the 20th. I realized that one of your experts, a person extremely well-versed on wireless smart meters, as well as professionally embedded within the AMI industry, and therefore, perhaps not as trustworthy to my mind anyway, as an independent consultant named Rick Schmidt, downplayed the dangers of smart meter fires. I would like to counter his suggestion that statistically these fires are insignificantly small by challenging each of you to Google the term smart meter fires and also smart meter fires in Sacramento specifically and see for yourself what videos and articles pop up. I would like to suggest that, according to other knowledgeable experts, a reason these fires appear to be statistically insignificant may be that when there is such a fire, the utility is called in to dismantle the wireless electronic microwave emitting smart meter from its connection to voltage ASAP thus removing the evidence of this type of fire hastily from the building for better or worse with or without intent of hiding such a fire because i don't know and so i ask you the great and generous people who are our publicly elected and accountable representatives in longmont our city council why on earth would insurance companies refuse to insure smart meters were it not for this obvious danger and other known hazards? Mechanical analog meters last up to 50 years. Our analog meter is nearly 25 years old and ticking along like the Energizer Bunny and is not a fire hazard compared with a wireless smart meter. 
add this to all the evidence of health harms from ubiquitous radio frequency waves, aka microwaves, in our current environment, and we have not only a recipe for disaster in terms of fire dangers, but also in terms of ours and our children's as well as our elders' health. As the damage continues to mount up, the more ambient and ubiquitous this microwave electro smog continues to proliferate. We need wise, wired cities, not wireless so-called smart infrastructure. I urge you to reconsider the AMI wireless smart meter program in Longmont, knowing that wired infrastructure is by far the healthier, safer way to move into a healthier future for all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. All right, next caller. Caller 983. 983, you should be able to unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the $25 um, um, circle um, wooden uh, uh, tokens. For my family, we live in an RV, and this is Darlene O'Shannon again. And uh, somebody stopped by and give us four of them. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to finish where I left off last week when I was cut off. And my last sentence was, with all due respect, now is not the time to make no parking loss because of the COVID and because it's freezing cold out here. So, and, and I just would like to know, just for your information, do you know that the dump station takes only credit cards, Visa, or MasterCard, and not everyone has credit cards? And also, I'd like to tell Mr. Dominguez that your COVID-19 we cannot turn down that road because it says do not enter. So I first saw that today. Um, and to Jeff Satter, I'd like to say of how many of those uh, vehicles that he towed off, 900, I think it was he mentioned, how many of those are RVs? And how many warning tickets were repeats of the same vehicle? And to Karen with coordinated entry, I'd like to say, how many from Longmont did you put in the Boulder shelter? And did you know that when they came back to Longmont, they were not able to get services from our center because they were now Boulder residents? And did I hear someone say, mention for RVs going to Well County? Well, does that mean we can't get any services from Boulder County if you did that? What a dilemma. <laughs> so anyways, and about the parking. Suppose I do find a place to park outside of the city limits and I come in with my RV and I park in the city. Can I park in front of the laundromat, laundromat without without uh, getting in trouble? How about if I came to church? Can I park to my RV in front of the church and get, not get in trouble? Um, you said absolutely no parking whatsoever. And what about, you need to then you mention sleepers. Well, what about 18 meters? There's plenty of 18 wheelers that park all over Longmont, lots of times. So anyways, I just wanted to bring some of these things to your attention. And um, I'm looking for a different place to go, but who knows? Yeah. So sending my love to all of you. Thank you very much for being there for us. Okay, thank you. Bye. All right, next caller. All right, caller 418, you should be able to unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes, caller 418. Yes, uh, this is Stan Toll. Confirm that I can be heard. You can be heard. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I, I'm talking about the, the, the sleeper vehicle ordinance. Uh, I guess it includes just about anything you can sleep in. Um, I guess you have to start towing every single car in the community now. Um, one of the things is is that we're in the middle of a pandemic, and we're doing this Zoom thing, and less than 10% of the people in the community can actually access know how to access these Zoom meetings. Um, 
And as far as the RV, there as part of the op- Colorado Open um, meeting law, people that are impacted by the law, there's a requirement that you that the city before it can be declared an open meeting electronically has to make arrangements for the people that the law impacts. How many people that are being impacted that are living in RVs has the city made arrangements for these people to be involved in these meetings? None of them. So this meetings are violating the open meeting uh, requirements in this state. And if you violate the open meeting statute, any decision that you make in, a, in violating the open meeting statutes are void. Okay. That's just a process. The actual law that you're trying to enact apparently uh, violates constitutional statutory rights of for people that have no other shelter operate options, and particularly people with disabilities like myself, who found that they cannot afford anything other than living in a vehicle at this time. So what happened is like under this Martin versus the city of Boise, there has to be other options. The city has been violating the Fair Housing Act by not allowing um, RV parking situations for people with disabilities and people with other options to have safe places to park. So, and also the coordinated entry, it's really coordinated entry is, is coordinated expulsion because you're declared not a resident of the of the, of the city anymore. And that, that's kind of a violation of people's rights. All right, Stan, that's three, um, that's three minutes, but we thank you very much for calling in. Appreciate it. All right, next caller. We should we have two more? Uh, I believe this is our last caller, caller okay. 518, caller ending in 518. You should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Please state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. Yes, my name is John Flower. My address is 719 Pendleton Avenue. Uh, I am president of the Ryder Ridge Homeowners Association, and I have lived at this address in Longmont for over 20 years. Uh, I have spoken um, before about this and addressed the council in writing earlier today. Um, the this new ordinance about RV parking uh, goes too far, and some of the other callers have mentioned some of the problems with it, and I'm going to talk about a different kind of problem. This ordinance makes it illegal for me to park my, my good condition, current licensed small motor home um, in front of my house just to clean the leaves or snow off my driveway. I mean, as I read the ordinance, that's what it's telling me. I can't put it out on the street. Um, our street is wide enough so it doesn't block anything and we use this as our second car so we're not going to put it in storage somewhere else now i understand the issues that the ordinance is trying to address one of the big triggers was people sleeping in vehicles in front of private homes that they have no relation with you know one of the early callers mentioned that we don't sleep in our vehicle except when we're traveling somewhere else and I know there's other issues, different issues around town, such as narrow streets in the old town area. So I have a couple of suggestions to make this workable. Um, first of all, make sure this ordinance is complaint driven. Make sure it's complaint driven and not just something that uh, code enforcement is supposed to drive around and look for uh, uh, problems. Because I can tell you if someone was camping in front of my house or blocking half the street on our block, I would be the first to call code enforcement. I mean, I, I agree that's a problem. And and like the last caller su- suggested, I'm going to say the same thing. You've got to put a little more effort into finding alternatives for people who need to sleep in their vehicle. Some of these are, you know, it, it, there's some kind of image of them. These are all vagrants and people that are homeless. You know, so not, that's not always the case. Some of these are traveling nurses or construction workers. I mean, 
you know, that are showing up for a project. So anyway, that's my two suggestions. Make sure this is complaint driven and that way the neighborhood where it's a problem is going to actually get the focus and puts and I remember all the problems that you had in trying to find up places for other people to sleep, but you know, you got to do something. So that's my two suggestions and I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. All right. That concludes first call public invited to be heard. Let's move on to the consent agenda. Don. Mayor Bagley, item 9A is ordinance 2020-59, a bill for an administrative ordinance approving the grant of a deed of conservation easement in gross from the city of Longmont to the Longmont Conservation District on the Newby Farms open space property, public hearing and second reading scheduled for December 1st, 2020. 9B is ordinance 2020-60, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport, hangar parcel H14B to Craig Nelson, public hearing and second reading scheduled for December 1st, 2020. 9C is Ordinance 2020-61, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the City of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal, Air Municipal Airport Hangar Parcel H37 to Robert Singer. Public, public hearing and second reading scheduled for December 1st, 2020. 9D is Resolution 2020-110, a resolution of the Longmont City Council authorizing the transfer of a portion of the unencumbered appropriation balance of the Employee Benefit Fund to the Employee Pension Fund. 9E is Resolution 2020-111, a resolution amending the financial policies of the City of Longmont for 2021. 9F is Resolution 2020-112, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the City of Longmont 2021 classification and pay plan for city employees. 9G, Resolution 20, pardon me, 2020-113, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and Boulder County for mediation services. 9H is res Resolution 2020-114, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and the State of Colorado, Division of Fire Prevention and Control for Emergency Facilities and Land, Use of Button Rock Reservoir, Clover Basin Reservoir, and McCall Lake. 9I is Resolution 2020-115, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and the Longmont Housing Authority for Support and Services. And 9J is approved one capital improvement program amendment. Do we have a motion? Councilmember Christensen? Uh, I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. second. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Christensen and second by Councilmember Peck. I saw your, move, your lips move first, so we'll count you, Councilmember Peck. All right, any further discussion or debate? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The consent agenda is moved and passes unanimously. All right, let's go on to ordinances on second reading. The first is ordin uh, uh, ten, um, item 10A, ordinance 2020-51, a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for the expenses and liabilities of the city of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2020. Are there any questions from council? All right, seeing none, staff does not have a presentation, I believe. All right, um, let's go ahead and open it. Actually, let's go ahead and take a three minute break. And if you are wanting to speak at uh, the public hearing for any of the, the uh, issues um, coming up, um, let's go ahead and just take a three minute break and call in now, okay? So back in three. All right, folks, if you would like to call in now for any of the public hearings on the matters on the agenda this evening, uh, now is your chance to do that. Please remember to mute the live stream and listen to the instructions on your telephone when you call. We'll admit folks into the meeting and call you by the last three digits of your telephone number.
Just a reminder, folks, that these are um, public hearing time to call in for any of the ordinances on second reading item 10 on the agenda. Uh, we've got just a couple more minutes here. And please remember to mute your live stream when you call and listen to the instructions on your telephone. All right. We back. Well, we're waiting for people to come back. Why don't we go ahead and open the public hearing on item 10A, ordinance 2020-51. Is there anybody in the queue for, for public hearing? Yes, Mayor, we have, uh, looks like about five folks in the queue. I am assuming that these are all RV related. Um, is there a way to uh, find out? Uh, I think we can do the hand raising with, I believe it's star nine, if you wanna do that. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and proceed. Um, and if you could raise your hand, if you are going to be addressing anything other than um, the RV ordinance, that would be helpful. Again, hit star nine if you want to address anything other than the RV ordinance. If you raise your hand, we will stop. We'll ask you which one you're gonna talk on and we'll make sure that we address it. But in the meantime, we're gonna go ahead and proceed. And uh, if someone does want to, we'll reopen, we'll, we'll, redo, we'll do a redo if for some reason somebody wants to say something about the budget. All right, so we'll go ahead and close the public hearing on ordinance 2020-51. Do we have a motion, please? All right, I'm gonna move ordinance 2020-51. Second. All right, it's been moved by myself, seconded by Dr. Waters. Any other debate? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-51 passes unanimously. Item 10B, ordinance 2020-52, a bill for an ordinance adopting the budget for the city of Longmont for the year 2021. Um, uh, any questions from council? All right, um, has anyone raised their hand? Don? We'll go ahead and open it to pub for public hearing. Don, are, did you No one has raised their hand, no. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing on ordinance 2020-52. Do we have a motion? I'll move uh, ordinance 2020-52. All second. All right, it's been moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by council member Hidalgo Faring. Any further discussion, debate, dialogue? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-52 passes unanimously. Item ordinance 2020-53, which is item 10C on the agenda, a bill for an ordinance making appropriations for the expenses and liabilities of the city of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2021. Any questions from council? Comments, concerns? Okay, seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Is anyone raising their hand? Don? No, they are not, Mayor. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing pertaining to ordinance 2020-53. Or Do we have an or, uh, a motion? Councilman Christensen, you put your hand near your ear. Do you wanna make a motion? No, I'm just moving the hair out of my face. <laughs> Somebody make a motion. I could, I'll move, I would I'll move ordinance 2020-53. Second. Uh, all right, it's been moved by Dr. Waters and seconded by Council Member Peck. Um, any further additional debate, dialogue? All right. All in favor of ordinance 2020-53, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-53 passes unanimously. All right, item 10D, ordinance 2020-54, a bill for an ordinance amending section 3.04.885, the Longmont Municipal Code, adopting an amendment to the employee contribution requirement of the City of Longmont General Employees Retirement Plan. Um, any questions from council? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Anybody raise their hand? I don't see anybody with a hand raised, Mayor. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Do we have a motion? I move Ordinance 2020-54. Second. It's been moved by Council Member Peck, seconded by Dr. Waters. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed aye. say nay. All right, Ordinance 2020-54 passes unanimously. All right, let's go on to item 10E, Ordinance 2020-55, a bill for an ordinance authorizing a farmland lease agreement between the City of Longmont and Joseph M. Dochef on the French property. Um, 
the uh, are there any questions from council? All right, anybody? Let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Anybody? Uh, in, anybody hit star nine? Doesn't look like it, Mayor, as of yet. All right. Well, they, uh, I'm going to go ahead and we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. The reason I'm chuckling is a couple of years ago I went out and met with Larry French to check out the lease to look into this particular farm, this this area that we're leasing, and uh, he got me in his pickup truck looked at me, proceeded to go 30 miles an hour in reverse and just nailed my suburban. Uh, yes, anyway, that's why I was chuckling. Good memories. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. I'm sorry, Mayor. Who moved yep. that and seconded oh. that? Uh, do, I'll move it. Dr. Waters, you want to second it? I'll second. All right, it's been moved and seconded by Dr. Waters. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. It passes unanimously. All right, ordinance, uh, let's see here. Ordinance 2020-56, which is item 10F, a bill for an ordinance conditionally approving the vacation of right-of-way within the Villas, the Ute Creek subdivision, generally located north of 17th Avenue and west of Pace Street. Um, any questions from council? All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Anybody hit star nine, Don? No takers on this one either, Mayor. All right, no takers. We'll go ahead and close the public hearing. We have a motion. I'll move forward to 2020-56. All right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and take it as uh, moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by council member Christensen. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, ordinance 2020-56 passes unanimously. We're gonna go ahead and skip 10G for a moment. Let's go on to 10H. Ordinance 2020-58, a bill for an administrative ordinance approving the purchase option agreement to convey a parcel of city-owned land located at 2000 Sunset Way to Sunset Element LLC. All right, let's go ahead and ask if there's any questions from council. All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Anybody want to talk on Ordinance 2020-58? Anybody hitting star nine? No, Mayor. <laughs> no takers. Uh -huh. All right, I didn't think so. Running a risk there, just jumping all over the agenda, but trying to keep her moving along. All right, so we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Do we have a motion to pass Ordinance 2020-58? Council I'll Member Dago. Okay. I'll move Ordinance 2020-58. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved by Council Member Dago Faring, seconded by Council Member Christensen. All in favor of passing Ordinance 2020-58, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, item 10H, Ordinance 2020-58, passes unanimously. All right, now let's go back to item 10G, Ordinance 2020-57, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 11 of the Longmont Municipal Code on vehicles abandoned, kept on public property, or jumped. Let's go ahead and have the staff report. So, Mayor and Council, um, I know we presented this to you all on a couple of occasions, so we don't have a detailed presentation on this at this point. I did want to clarify, there were some questions about us asking uh, the county in terms of their involvement in, in consideration of the fairgrounds. Uh, I did receive a letter from uh, Jana Peterson, who's the county administrator on this issue. Um, I sent that um, via email to you all, but generally what uh, I want to call council's attention to is the last paragraph where it said, um, I want to go before that, actually, the, the HSBC, we talked about the recommendation they made during the, the last council session. The county commissioner supported the board's motion and recommendation and agreed with the concerns expressed. They also directed staff to work with um, us and follow up on the assessment of impacted RV dwellers to inform whether there's an interest and a need for short-term 60 days or less option using the fairgrounds to fill a tempor temporary gap until other options are, are developed. And so we have reached out to Robin Bohannon. Um, Jana and I have talked about this issue and we'll continue the conversations. Generally what they want us to look at is, and this is gonna be part of another survey that we're gonna do is really understand where individuals fit and what the need is and, and again, as we stated before, and I'm gonna ask Karen to jump in in case I miss something, is really focusing on A, the connection to coordinated entry. B, we also know that there's some additional federal funds that are coming into play that they have talked about enabled um, 
that could be in play to assist individuals that are willing to go into the coordinated entry program and move through that process. So I um, wanted to tell council more conversations that we need to have um, with county staff. We're building an operational plan in terms of determining what that need is. We are also, have, we've reached out to Andy at Hope, we've reached out to Sarah Arney, David Kennedy, and other individuals to get a sense of the different demographics and, and, and where the support is needed. And, and we can bring, we will be bringing more information to you all based on our conversations with the county. Karen, did I miss anything? Uh, no, Harold, I don't have anything to add unless there are questions. All right, so let's, oh. all right, sorry, my alarm went off. Councilmember Christensen? You're, you're, on, you're on mute, Polly, and my alarm was to go get my wheat fins, but I'll wait till break. I'm kidding, that's okay. not what it was for. Okay, I, I would like to make a few statements. Um, okay. My neighbor across the street who has a giant uh, contractor's van, um, who would be affected by this perhaps because it hasn't been clarified in the law. Nevertheless, he um, has a, uh, he owns a business down on Delaware Street. And as I think we all know, various businesses are just as affected, in fact, more so by this uh, problem as um, residential areas. Everybody's actually affected. The situation down on Delaware Street this morning was that he came to work and people in order to sleep in their van had thrown all the material out of their van onto the street, which looked like an explosion of trash so that they could sleep in their van. We just, we just can't let this go on. However, and, and um, we have also heard from uh, a left-hand brewery that uh, their employees come out at 11 o'clock at night sometimes and um, are subject to people who are dealing drugs and people who are threatening them or they feel, un they feel threatened. Uh, I know that I've talked to the people over on uh, Budget Hardware and there are people going to the bathroom in the bushes, there are people unloading things and dumping trash and dumping sewage out on the street. So I understand, we, and we all know, we have to do something about this. But I, can't, I, I don't want to create more problems than we already have. I want us to be clear about the fact that it should state somewhere here that it is illegal or not permissible to sleep in or live in any vehicle on the public streets of Longmont because it creates a public safety and public health danger. If we don't say that, then we're just taking the wimpy way out by just, we're creating an ordinance. What is the purpose of the ordinance? We need to focus on the problem, which is people living in their vehicles. It's not every RV in this town. There are probably hundreds of contractor vans, contractor trailers, um, and uh, RVs like Mr. Flowers, who seem to think that we would not let them park in front of their house for 48 hours, although I think it's pretty clear in the law that they can do that. I think the ordinance as written is a little confusing and I cannot vote for it unless it clarifies that it is illegal to sleep in or live in any vehicle on the public streets of Longmont because it creates a public safety and public health danger. Secondly, the term sleeper vehicle, which is not a term any other municipality uses, and is actually a very strange and vague term. And if you look it up, if you Google it, it has nothing to do with RVs. I think it needs to be replaced by vehicle or the definition of sleeper vehicle, which is slang, which should not be used in the ordinance, but it's on page four, it's on under 4B line 16, page three. It should be at the top of the ordinance. So it explains what a sleeper vehicle is since it is any not a legal term, not a term used by, I, I don't know who uses this term, but anyway, unless we make this law clear, I can't vote for it. Sleeper vehicle needs to be defined 
at the very beginning, as we have done on page three. <laughs> so those are um, three, two things that need to happen as far as I'm concerned to clarify this law and make it focus on the problem instead of affecting every RV owner in town. Um, in addition to which I would like us to list uh, places that people can go. When we give, if we tag a vehicle, they need to be told where, what their alternatives are. Their alternatives, if they can find, they can go to a place that has, uh, there are some places down in Lafayette and various other places that do have openings for RVs they can apply to get into the coordinated entry program. We have to, we can't just give them a ticket and threaten to tow and crush their vehicle and not give them an alternative. And I believe that uh, January 1st may be cutting it a little short to begin to work on this law. In short, I, I don't think this law is um, up to snuff for passing it tonight but I agree we have a horrible problem, so. Uh, Tim, is Tim Hole around? Can you, just curious, just curious, could you read the definition of sleeper vehicle that's in the ordinance, please? Is it there? Hey, give me one second, hold on. It's page three, 4B, line 16. So the definition of sleeper vehicle existed in the current code where we amended it a little bit, um, but what it says now is sleeper vehicle means any camper coach, trailer vehicle, motor home, multi-purpose trailer or trailer coach. We have added recreational vehicle and clarified that it includes any vehicle converted to serve as temporary living or sleeping accommodation. So Tim, can you explain to me why that isn't right at the top of the ordinance because you're using a term that nobody really, that is not used by other municipalities without defining it until three pages later. So we put it in with the definition section. So we are defining the term in the definition section because it's used several times throughout the code. Yeah, well. Uh that's pretty commonplace for how statutes Gen are written. Yeah, generally, if you're going to use it in more than one place, if we have the definition outside of a definition section, then it kind of causes people to have to go bouncing around looking for that definition. Um, so if it's used more than once, we tend to try to put it in the definition section. Councilmember Peck? I'm sorry, yeah, Councilmember Peck and then Councilmember Martin. I don't think that Councilwoman Christensen was finished. I'm not sure, was she? Uh, I'm not. But. So go, go ahead, Councilwoman Christensen. If you'd like to continue, go ahead. And, and may I, just one clarification that the rest of that code section appears above the definition of sleeper vehicle because it's alphabetical. Um, so that's just in the definition of abandoned or publicly kept. So it appears above sleeper just alphabetically. Right, and so to be clear, Councilmember Christian had finished. I asked my question, then we're going on Councilmember Peck, but I can go back to Councilmember Christensen if she'd like to follow up. You're on, you're on mute. You're, you're muted, Polly. I would like to follow up because editorially, what is common throughout all editorial writing and academic writing is the first time you use a term, you define it and thereafter, you may use the slang version of it or the acronym or whatever, but you define it on first use. I realize it's different in legal writing, but um, I, you know, when I, most people read this law, they have no idea what a sleeper vehicle is, particularly if you're encouraging people not to sleep in their vehicle. It seems an odd term to use to refer to the thing that you won't, don't want them to do in the first place. Okay, anyway. All right, Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, 
I, I want to make a, uh, a a clarification in my vote last time we had this up on first reading. I agreed with the uh, sleeper vehicle part of the ordinance. And I'm going to bring up once again, I, I thank uh, Jeff Sater for uh, reaching out to me on this issue. But I'm um, going to bring it up again, explain, and then make a motion. If it passes, it does. If it not, it doesn't. That's the way it is. We have the in the definition of abandoned and junk vehicles, this statement. It says, any vehicle, any vehicle other than a sleeper vehicle um, is going to be an abandoned and junked vehicle if it's in a public space for 48 hours or longer. Think about that. Any vehicle that is on a public space for 48 hours or longer is in the definition of an abandoned and junked vehicle. So when you go down to the abatement section, that says that any abandoned or junked vehicle can is in the abatement section, which is basically being towed. I totally disagree with that. Why would we have any vehicle that is parked on a public street thoroughfare park for over two, out, two days become an abandoned and junked vehicle by definition. And then because it has been labeled that, it can be uh, towed, impounded in the abatement section. So uh, that leaves that whole section up to interpretation. And I, and I want to make the caveat that I totally trust our public safety department Jeff Satter, our detectives, and that they would not probably target a vehicle to be impounded. But this ordinance does not say anything about ticketing, about uh, giving a, a, a warning. It just says they can be towed. So I am going to move that we do one of two things. We either take the wording any vehicle out of there and define what we think a really a junked vehicle is or an abandoned vehicle or leave it in there and say that it will be ticketed. I understand that when talking to Detective Satter that he said that this is by complaint only that these vehicles are even looked at, but that isn't mentioned anywhere in this ordinance. This is a law. When we have turnover in our public safety department, when we have people retiring, we don't even have a chief of police hired yet. When we, they look at this law, there is no way that a resident can fight this because the public safety department is doing exactly what the law says that they can tow a vehicle that is left for two days on a street by complaint. But we don't know that it's by complaint. It doesn't say it at all in there. So um, I move that, what section is this? Section four, line one, where it says any vehicle other than a sleeper vehicle, we change, we either take that wording out and define exactly what a, what a junked vehicle is. It's not any vehicle. And, or, or we change the wording to say that it will be ticketed. All right, uh, Tim, just Second. a quick question. Uh, okay, it's been moved and seconded. Tim, just a quick question on um, your thoughts on where the RV and junk vehicle statutes merge. Where there's over, there's, is there crossover? Are we talking about two different issues? Is it the same issue? Two different. They're two different issues. Um, they're kind of in the they kind of blend together. We this this revision isn't touching the forty eight hour provision for other vehicles. 
except for to the reorganization as we've discussed before. Right. Um, so so, so I, I see them as different, but. Right. So, so this, so I guess, Joan, I guess this would probably, I feel this would be more appropriate to raise. And if we want to address the junk vehicle 48 hour issue, um, we can, we can do that. But I guess my, my concern is that, that what you're, what you just moved doesn't necessarily touch on the statute that was, that's before council. But Mayor Bagley, it is in the ordinance that we're passing. If we are amending this order, this ordinance now, we, I don't even know why it's in this ordinance, to be quite honest, why right. that particular thing is. But if we, are, if we are going to pass this ordinance, then we are passing it with that statement can, in can it. You, can you read the statement to us? Sure, I'll be glad to. It says, any vehicle other than a sleeper vehicle left on public property, including any portion of a highway, street, alley, or other right of way for 48 hours or longer. It's the definition of an abandoned or junked vehicle. And is that in this particular, I don't have my packet yes, open right now. Yes, it is. Is, in that, is that in this statute, Tim? Yes, it's on page. It yep, and so my question it, is it, how does that, Tim, how does that not then take two separate issues and overlap? This 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 ordinance will move it in the definition um, in a numbered list, but otherwise it doesn't change that. So um, we didn't so, make so any change to the definition of the forty eight hours. We just moved so it the, around. So it's the definition. The the definition, is, and then what what statute? If it's not this one, does that definition apply to? Because it's not this. So basically, what Councilmember Peck is referring to is a definition, but it's not actually the statute that that says that you cannot have a, a, a junk vehicle. The junk vehicle statute is not this one, correct? Meaning the definition is there because it's the definition section. They do merge, um, they, do, they do merge. So either, either of those two will both equal an abandoned or junk vehicle that can be taken care of in a later portion in the same manner. And right now it's 48 hours? Yes. Okay. So. Just to, and I'd just like to address Councilmember Peck, your concern. I would totally, I would totally agree with you. Um, however, what needs to happen is it, it is complaint driven, not because it's we're taking somebody's word for it. It's just, just that's the way it happens. Meaning that someone has to call and complain, or even in theory, if you're driving along and and you just go, hey, that arbitrary car is parked on a on the on the road, and I need to, we need to make sure that particular car that's parked is going to move within 48 hours. They still get out, mark it, have to give notice. They can't just take it. And then the, the, the driver will be given notice and they have to move it within 48 hours. But parking enforcement's not going to do that because, I mean, they see the car, but they'd have to stay there for 48 hours to watch it. So it doesn't, it's just not the way enforcement works. My problem, Mayor Bagley, is that it is in the definition of an abandoned or junked vehicle. Why would we call somebody's car a junked vehicle, allowing it to be towed? Why would we I do guess, Well, because you'd go, if you go over to, I mean, like I, I get, I've gotten a call from two different people every quarter since I've been on council, and they complain that there are, there's a guy, there's a homeowner that owns eight cars and he parks them along the street and other people would like to use the street, but he treats it as his own parking spot. And, uh, we do, the real question is, do we want people to be able to just park their cars and not move them for long periods of time? That's really, that's really what we're doing. And, uh, do we want public streets being treated like personal property? Um, I, I think we should encourage people to park their cars in the driveway and not occupy public streets. But not everybody, has, Mark, not everybody has a driveway in this city. And, and, and that is, and I don't know what they do downtown to tell you the truth, but Councilor Martin? Well, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, the reason that Tim has said that, that that hasn't changed is because the ordinance has 
always been you had to move a car every 48 hours or it was considered abandoned, correct? Is that correct? That is correct. And, and I want to clarify, it's abandoned or publicly kept and junked is a different definition. Okay, right. But, but nevertheless, the, the statute has always been that if you're going to park on the street, you couldn't do it for longer than 48 hours. And that's because somebody else needs a chance at the public parking. Um, even if it's right in front of their house, they don't own the parking in front of their house. Um, anybody can park there. Um, and uh, while I have had to tell a number of people that they did not own the parking in front of their house, um, I have never received a complaint about someone leaving a car for several days without moving it on the public street, except occupied sleeper vehicles. That complaint, of course, we get all the time. But I, I don't understand the reason for revisiting um, the part of the ordinance that's working. I mean, what we're doing right now is revisiting the part of the sleeper vehicle ordinance that's clearly not working because it creates a public health hazard. So I, I would feel better confining the debate to that. All right, well, let's, if nobody else has any, well, we have a motion on the table, unless somebody really wants to say something, let's go ahead and vote on the motion. Um, Mr. Hull? Um, one point of clarification, there is uh, a drafting error that I would ask that the council uh, well, we're amend. Not, well, we get the motion on the table right now is not for the, we'll, we'll come back to that in just a second, but right now the motion is to either strike the word any vehicle or what was that? What was the what was you read? Re, can you restate your motion, Council Member Peck? I will in a minute, but to Council Member uh, Martin's uh, comment, the reason I'm bringing up is because that is part of the change in this ordinance. It has the original wording was struck out. This is a change to this ordinance, and that is what we are voting on. All of the changes to this ordinance. Um, what was the change? What was it before? Because okay. Mr. Holt just told me that it was, it's the same as it was before. It says what is struck out is any sleeper vehicle or trailer parked on public property, including any portion of, they use sleeper vehicle. They added any vehicle. They changed that to any vehicle or they replaced it with any vehicle. That was the elliptical part. And that's why I brought it up. Well, I think is it what, I, that was the clarification that I was asking for, because I thought that was part of the reordering. Was uh, Mr. Hole? Could you tell us? Was it was it any vehicle, no matter where it physically was in the ordinance? Was the statute that the forty eight hours applied to any vehicle? The only change to that section is, is its ordering. So it appears as a as a red line and a, and a new insertion, just because that's how the ordinance has to be drafted. Um, but the only change to that section was the ordering. Okay. Does not change the language whatsoever. Thank you. Um, so restating that motion was um, either strike any vehicle or um, add that it, it would be my problem is it's the in the abatement section um, that the any vehicle um, I don't really know how to state it to be quite honest that any vehicle that other than a sleeper vehicle uh, is deemed abandoned or junked per definition be taken out of the abatement part that right. it, that it be ticketed rather right. than Hold Hold on one second, one second, one second, one second. Joe, you're, remember that in just a second, okay? Because we're going to have to split it into two. I'm going to take your motion as two votes. All right. Mo the first motion is striking any vehicle. And then the second will be removing the language that you just said. Okay. Yes. So the motion is to strike the wording any vehicle. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. All, all opposed say nay. Nay. Aye. Aye. All right. The nays have it. The motion fails with Councilmember Christensen and Councilmember Peck four. The second motion will be will be taken as a motion to strike the following language. Joan, could you read it, please? 
any vehicle other than a sleeper vehicle left on a public property, including any portion of a highway, street, alley, or other right of way for 48 hours or longer um, is okay. in abandoned and uh, junker definition. All right. All in favor, say aye. Well, the motion is to take it out of- Correct, the correct. The motion is to, to strike what Council Member Peck just read. Okay, all in favor, say aye. I, I actually, I have a question. All right. So if we do that, then I'd like to know um, how would that impact? What would that do in removing that language? The ability to, um, I get, I, you know, and I'm thinking more of the lines because I've I've had calls and I've gone out to different areas, taken pictures looked at stuff that was, I mean, it clearly looks like people are just dumping their RVs in the street. And we can't have that. This, I understand that we need to take care of that. Um, I take care of that piece. I'm just wondering if we strike the language, what would that do with the city's ability to be able to, to address those issues? I assume it would make it difficult. Yeah, well, let me. Yeah, I'd like to hear. Kind of falls apart. Councilmember, <clears throat> Councilmember, let's go. Let's go with Deputy Deputy Chief Satter for a second. Deputy Chief. Hello. Uh, thank you for letting me speak on this topic tonight. Um, as I stated last time, in the last two years, we tagged forty two hundred of these vehicles in Code ninety one, but this has a very negative impact on those neighborhoods without garages. Because if somebody parks in front of your house, that has a cascading effect all the way down the street. So if we remove that language, there would be no way to move those vehicles on. And at this point, as I said the last week, we tag those cars. So there is no cost to the owner for moving their vehicle. If we ticketed it, there would be a cost to the owner to pay a ticket. So right now they just get a warning and ask to move their car. Thanks, but it would have a very negative effect on the neighborhoods, in my opinion. All right, I, I don't want to. I don't want to cut off. I don't want to cut off debate. I can't do that. I don't have the authority to. We can keep talking, but the motion currently is just. We still have to talk about the the ordinance. This is just the motion by Councilmember Peck wanting to strike that particular language. Does anyone want to talk specifically about the motion to strike the language that Councilmember Peck just read? Councilmember Idago Faring. Do you have oh, another question um, or issue? Well, so I don't have, you know, I understand where um, Council Member Peck is coming from and and I agree with it, but I don't want to be able to create another problem. I feel like we need to have a deeper discussion on on individual pieces in the in the ordinance to add specific language that will address some of the um, concerns that residents have, as well as um, as well as people who maybe live in their vehicle, but are also friends or have some kind of connection with the residents that they may be parking in front of. I also want to be able to have discussion on what types of problem, what, how are some of the solutions, how are we progressing with coming up with some of the solutions before we move forward with this and then don't have any place to to put folks, and I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking about people who work here but live in their RVs, and I know quite a few folks, and I, I don't want to, you know, so that they, they spend money here. They, they happen to live in their RVs, but they spend money here. They work here. They just happen to live in their RVs. I want to be able to make sure that we have solutions in place before we just rush through all this. And I know it's probably not rushing because it sounds like it's been in discussion for a long time. All right. Again, so as we as we continue, we're only talking about the the motion by Councilmember Peck at this point. So we're going to go with Councilmember Christensen and then Councilmember Martin. So I'm very confused about what we're actually voting on right now. But we're we're voting the 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 the, the motion is to strike the language in the ordinance that reads as follows. Councilmember Peck, could you read it again, please? But I am going to pull my motion. Um, <laughs> okay. I am. It isn't going to pass. And I, 
And uh, I think this discussion is going on too long. Okay, well, the, well the, the chair will allow you to do that. Harold, it was just pulled. Do you have anything to say other than that? I wanted to say that you all have directed us. Um, motion was made by Council Member Christensen, seconded by Council Member Peck, and it passed to bring back this other component of the ordinance at a later date. And that's what I was gonna say is th that's where that conversation probably occur. it needs to occur is in that ordinance that we're gonna be bringing back to you all. All right, then that said, I'm gonna actually move ordinance 2020-57, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 11 of the Longmont Municipal Code on vehicles abandoned, kept on public property or junked. Don't, don't we need a public Are hearing? No, that'd be, uh, yeah, we do need a public hearing. So let's go ahead and open the public hearing. All right, well, we do have um, caller 518 with their hand up for this. Uh, caller 518, you should be able to unmute yourself, state your uh, name and address, and you have three minutes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> you know who I am. I'm John Flower. I spoke before. Just a couple quick comments. Um, in our homeowners association, we don't want to see uh, old junk vehicles, vehicles being worked on uh, in the driveways. And we have come up with a way of defining that because we've been rewriting our covenants that may be of help to you. We we simply say that if it's if you have a vehicle, um, it has to be on the driveway, it can't be in your yard, and it has to be currently licensed. So that's the wording we use is currently licensed. So I think in some of the cases you're dealing with vehicles that uh, are not currently licensed, nobody's using them, and I think that that's been an effective way for us to look at it. Uh, I also, just listening to the comments by council members, I absolutely agree with what Polly Christensen brought up and also with what Joan Peck brought up. Um, you know, those are very good points. So that's really all I wanted to say is that I, I agree with Polly Christensen and Joan Peck's comments. I'm imploring you, please don't pass this ordinance until you had a, a, a chance to look at the issues that I brought up, plus the issues that some of the other callers earlier brought up. They're, uh, they're valid concerns that uh, like one of the other council members just mentioned about that there are people living in these vehicles who are, they're not bad people, you know, they're working here. <laughs> so it, you got to deal with that whole thing. But anyway, think about the wording of currently licensed. That could be a solution to some of that discussion about junk vehicles. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Is there anyone else in, in, the, in the hearing queue? Uh, yep, we have a few more folks. Caller 137. How, how many is a few? Just so we One, know. two, well, three, I believe we have left. Okay, great. Caller 137. 137, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Great, thank you. My name is Annie Kurtz, and I'm an attorney and Equal Justice Works Fellow at the ACLU of Colorado, which is at 303 17th Ave in Denver. Uh, and I'm here to speak in opposition to Ordinance 2020-57, which I fear will undermine the health and housing stability of Longmont's most vulnerable residents at a particularly dangerous moment. Uh, this ordinance, on the one hand, as some have already stated tonight, is overly broad. By banning all recreational or sleeper vehicles from parking on public property in every part of the city at all hours and for any amount of time, the ordinance sweeps within its reach unobjectionable activity. This law would mean a family traveling in their RV could not stop for lunch on Main Street without threat of their vehicle being impounded during their meal. On the other hand, the reality is that the ordinance's most bitter impact would fall on the city's most marginalized residents, for whom the prohibited vehicles are last resort for securing affordable shelter, rest, safety, privacy, and access to other basic human needs in Longmont. But punishing people merely for sheltering in their vehicles when they have no other meaningful option raises constitutional concern. Courts have concluded that it violates the Eighth Amendment to punish someone for sleeping outside on public property when no indoor option is available to them. 
punishing people for sleeping in their vehicles when they lack meaningful alternatives raises the same concern. Longmont Safe Parking Lot is closed to RVs, and the other lots that, to my knowledge, have been explored by the city would provide temporary accommodation at best. At the same time, the point in time survey, a known undercount of those experiencing homelessness in Boulder County, reveals inadequate shelter space for those who might seek it. Not to mention that during this surging pandemic, crowded shelters only jeopardize the health of guests in the larger community, such that the CDC warns against clearing encampments of unhoused residents unless individual housing units are available. Colorado faces an affordable housing crisis, a financial crisis, and a public health crisis, and winter is coming. Now is not the time to strip a crucial safety net from Longmont's housing insecure, whose ranks are only predicted to swell when COVID-19-related eviction moratoria eventually expire. Given the inadequacy of housing and shelter in Longmont, the proposed outright ban on RV parking will force people to choose between leaving the city they call home and living on the streets. ACLU of Colorado urges the city council not to pass ordinance 2020-57. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next caller. All right. Caller number 418. Caller 418, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, this is Stan Cole again. And I, I, I'd like to really put it to you that you're treating people that are living in vehicles as some sort of enemy that are something that we need to expel from the community. And I, I've listened to Peck. Peck has several times says, why can't they go to Will County? Why can't they? That, you know, these are residents of the community that through policies that the city council has been following, has made this problem. Um, the town has expanded, and we have not expanded uh, places where people run into problems. And there's people who are disabled. There's people who are who are working, and they're trying to save money so they could maybe get something. And. So you're rushing this, and there's a lot of things like when you put a tag on somebody's vehicle saying you're going to impound it, by law, you have to give a person a chance to have a hearing before his property is taken. Now, I had the experience of one having a vehicle impounded illegally, and when I went to try to get an impound hearing, I was arrested and put in jail, and I was prosecuted for trespassing. That is blatantly, blatantly unconstitutional, because if somebody's property is getting taken, you are required to provide him with a hearing before the property is taken, and after the property is taken, within 24 hours, he needs to have a hearing. When you presented the little card that people have put on their vehicles, there is no notice on that that people have a right to a hearing. And other communities like Santa Barbara, California, where my sister lives, they simply allow people to park in, in the parking rides at night, and they have a little porta potty there. And then the people leave, leave in the morning. There are alternatives. The thing is, is that you guys seem to be of the idea that we have to leave. And like I've said, with a uh, coordinated entry, you know, you sign up for that. All of a sudden, you're not a resident of, of City of Longmont. Yeah, that is some sort of expulsion plan. Now, if you have coordinated entry, it has to be for the city of Longmont, not to be sent off to Kansas or something like that. So what I suggest, and it's what I have been saying, is that under Colorado open meeting laws, people are supposed to be allowed to be involved in the legislative process. If you are excluding any group Stand from that, 
that, that that's about three minutes, 20 seconds. We're going to have to go on to the next caller, but thank you. All right, next caller. Uh, caller 606. Are you able to unmute yourself? Caller 606. Is this the last caller? This is the last caller. 606, are you able to unmute yourself? I think it's star six. There we go. I heard there we go. Good evening, Council. My name is Monique Myers. I actually reside in Boulder, but I have a business that happens to operate in a small toy hauler, which could be considered an RV. And it's mostly a question. Uh, I teach sewing classes out of the RV, and I would park for, say, two hours at a time in a neighborhood. Would my case fall under your regulation? Thank you. All right. That concludes the public hearing. Um, let's go ahead. And uh, did you get that last question, Tim? I think I got most of it. It was a, a toy hauler that has been converted. Yeah, that's what it sounded like. It would be a vehicle that's been converted to sleep in. So yes, right? It, it depends. So uh, the converted to, to converted to sleep in, I imagine that is an, an overt conversion, some sort of like you have a school bus that you have taken all the seats out of and, and really changed it. Um, so I'd have to see. Okay. It right. seems like a judgment call. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and Councilmember Martin, you're going to be next, but I'm going to move ordinance 2020-57, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 11 of the Longmont Municipal Code on vehicles abandoned, kept on public property or junked. Second. All right. It's been seconded. Councilmember Martin. I would like to say that the last woman who called didn't say anything about using her vehicle to sleep in. She said something about using it to teach from. So it's like a bookmobile only for crafts. And she parks it in a neighborhood for two to four hours, which means that she wouldn't come under the violation of the statute at all. Um, and I, it may be a problem with organization of this statute because, you know, I read it and I think it's clear that, you know, you're not in violation of anything until you leave the vehicle in one place for 48 hours or longer or occupy it while it's parked, um, like for sleeping. And, um, uh, you know, if, if neither of those things happen, then somebody, then, then, you know, all these people that are concerned that they're going to get in trouble, uh, fall afoul of this law, are just imagining this, that because they're not finding where it says, you know, they're not associating parking and the duration of time um, that has to elapse before they're in violation. So I'm not sure, I'd, 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 I'd like uh, Mr. Hull to talk about that uh, and, and explain to us um, where it says, you know, that, that the vehicle has to stay in one place for 48 hours before it can be tagged. So I, I may have missed, I, I, I think I made an assumption that she said she slept in the vehicle um, or had modified it for sleeping. Um, the definition that we're changing that this ordinance is really focusing on is a sleeper, a camper coach, a camper trailer, a motorhome, multi-purpose trailer, trailer coach, or recreational vehicle includes converted to serve as temporary living accommodation. So something that is really focused on somebody on, on being accessible for somebody to sleep in. Her vehicle, it sounds like, would fall under just in any vehicle category. That one would need uh, 48 hours, as we've discussed earlier. Right. And, and in fact, the, the thing that people aren't understanding is, is that any vehicle um, can park for less than 48 hours in a designated parking place on a street, right? In, in any place that's not marked as no parking. And if they don't, if they leave it there for less than 48 hours, they're fine, correct? 
as long as they follow all the traffic laws, they aren't impeding the flow of traffic, those kinds of things. And there's a valid license. Yeah, okay. So none of those things are changing, is that correct? This is only changing what happens with a sleeper vehicle. That is correct. Thank you. Councilmember Christensen. Um, I wanna thank Councilman Martin for bringing up the, this subject, the fact that both the mayor and the assistant city attorney, attorney who both heard the same thing we heard, both said it would cover it means that it's confusing to people. You know, there are lots of people like this woman who have um, mobile services that they perform, whether it's cutting dog hair or human hair or delivering classes, um, as this last woman said, or um, plumbing services, uh, electrical services. I mean, these are exactly the people, I, they're making a living using their vehicles and they're not parked for more than a few hours usually in front of or anywhere. I don't want them to feel that they are going to be impacted by this. Um, and uh, that's precisely what I think is what it, people are feeling. And as Councilwoman Martin said, this, this woman just teaches classes. She's and she said quite clearly, I teach, I converted this to teach classes. I'm parked for a couple of hours in front of a place. And I applaud people like that who were, you know, they're entrepreneurs. They may not be uh, wealthy, but they're, they're making a decent living for themselves and their family. I don't want to discourage them. I guess uh, seeing no hands, just, I guess, again, there's a, there's a difference of fact. If that woman meant I'm going to be sleeping in it, yes. If she's not sleeping in it, then no. So um, the, the, the law is pretty clear and it would depend on the fact. So, all right, there's a motion on the, uh, there's a motion on the table, but Councilmember Member Ferry. So, you know, I want to clarify. So the, um, the state, the question or the comment from um, Ms. Hertz, Annie Hertz about, um, a family who maybe have their RV and they park in front of a restaurant. So it's not going to be towed or it's not going to be tagged. Um, you know, I think, you know, I'm just, as I look through, I keep scrolling up and down and trying to see, you know, some of it's, some of the language in there is kind of left to interpretation. And when I look at, you know, it's complaint only, but does it stipulate that in here? I don't, I don't see that unless I'm missing something. I've looked at it so many times now, I'm, it's all blending in. Um, and so, you know, so I guess looking at specifics in that. Um, the other thing too is, you know, if somebody's parking their RV in front of their house and as the, um, the caller had, had stated, when he's having to let his, when they come back and they have to leave it out, you know, drain the fridge and do all whatever they have to do before they can put it away, it might be longer than 48 hours. What if they don't get along with their neighbor and their neighbor's just calling and complaining? Where, where's that kind of, I just feel like there's, it's, it's left open to interpretation and too much, too many variables. I, I don't know. They'd have to, to answer your question, they'd have to show up in market and start the clock. Okay. So and in order, in order to be, in order to lose, in order to win a case in court, you'd have to mark it so that they can say, okay, now we're starting the 48 hour clock. Now we're starting the 48 hours. So it's 48 hours from the time that it is tagged. Not, so not, yeah, we don't, we don't take the neighbor's word for it. Then law enforcement shows up or parking enforcement and says, I'm going to count the time. So can we have something stipulated in language? So it's very clear to residents. Would that be helpful? Is that necessary in your opinion, Mr. Hole? Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, in terms of clarifying that for residents, I, I, I don't know if I have a comment there in terms of um, how we would, it would actually operate in fact, we would still have to prove our case that it's been there for 48 hours, just as the mayor has commented. Um, and, and while I'm speaking, Mr. Mayor, uh, I did have one uh, 
revision that we need to make before any any final say here. Um, the effective date on section seven is 2020. It should be 2021. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Peck. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, for the loading and unloading, there is no time stipulation. Can I read this portion so everybody um, understands? There is no 48 hour thing according to this. It says active loading or unloading means the period of time in which a person or persons are physically engaged in the labor of loading or, or unloading from an apartment, condominium, townhouse, home, or business. It, there is no 48 hour stipulation that I can see. Is that correct, Mr. Hull? The 48 hours applies only to, only to vehicles other than sleeper vehicles. There is a permit that you can get uh, and we have the permit section to have seven days. Right, but if they're loading or unloading their uh, camper, they can take the time they need to load or unload it. There's no time stipulated here. Is that correct? As, as long as they're actively loading and unloading, yes. Okay, yes. thank you for clarifying that. Marsh Martin. Thanks, I just would like to say that uh, I think we're spending way too much time on this because when I read the ordinance, I thought that it was clear and I've been giving people advice for the last five or six days, um, consistent with what Mr. Hole is saying the ordinance says. So um, yeah, I just, I, I think we're making a tempest in a teapot here and we should just vote. All right, is anyone else opposed to that? Dr. Waters? I just want to <clears throat> clarify, uh, the, e even if, if somebody was not in the act of actively loading or unloading, uh, because it's it, it, because they need two or three days to load or unload. Absent a complaint, somebody would have the flexibility to load and unload for as long as they need to load and unload. Is that fair? Tim? My understanding from, from staff is that uh, we sh the staffing requirements are that we are going to respond to complaints, but that's gonna be a question probably for, for Jeff. For Jeff then. Well, let me just anticipate that Jeff's response would be, yeah, it's complaint driven. And I, so I wanna make a point uh, that the, the current, our current practice under the current ordinance is all complaint driven. Jeff's on the screen. Is that true, Jeff? That's correct. Uh, except for some really extreme examples. So but unless unless the council thinks that somehow in the current ordinance, uh, the, 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 our, the code enforcement and public safety is operating inconsistently with the current ordinance. The current ordinance doesn't make any reference to the re requirement for it to be complaint driven. I mean, you'd be adding something uh, to, to, the, to a new ordinance that has been unnecessary in the current ordinance when it comes to implementation or enforcement. Now, I don't know why we would have to add language that's not in the current co current ordinance to do what we're doing under the current ordinance. Done. All right, there's a motion on the table for ordinance 2020-57. All in favor of passage of ordinance 2020-57 on second reading, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. All right, Joan, were you and I? Okay. Susie, were you and I? Okay, so the ordinance passes six to one with council member Christensen opposed. All right, let's go on. Uh, so nothing was removed from the consent agenda. Let's move on to actually, should we take a brief three minute break real quick before we move on to general business? We got a bunch of resolutions we're gonna hammer through. Shouldn't be too hard, but should we take a two minute, three minute break? All right, let's take a two minute, three minute break. See you in a second.
All right, we're back. One, two, three, four, five. Miss Aaron and Marsha. We're not missing Marsha. Pop Tart people. Too bad we're virtual. I'd share. All right, we're all back. All right, let's go ahead and um, uh, I, I move that we, uh, let's go on to general business. I move that we recess at the Longmont City Council and convene as the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District number one. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, motion carries. Resolution LGID 2020-06 is a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District Number 1, adopting the annual budget for the district for the fiscal year 2021. Do we have a motion? I'll move uh, resolution 2020-6. I'll second that. All right, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, resolution LGID 2020-06 passes unanimously. Um, I move that we adjourn as the Longmont General Improvement District Number One Board of Directors and convene as the Longmont Urban Renewal Authority. Second. All right, that's been moved by myself and seconded by Councilmember Christensen, I believe. Is that what that hand was for? Okay. Um, and let's go ahead and vote. All in favor of convening as the Longmont Urban Renewal Authority, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Acting as the Longmont Urban Renewal Authority, resolution LURA 2020-01, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners, the Longmont Urban Renewal Authority, adopting the annual budget for the authority for the fiscal year 2021. All in favor, or uh, uh, do you have a motion? I'll move that. I can't see it on my screen right now. All right, we're good. Okay. All right, so there's a motion for resolution LURA-2020-01. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed aye. say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. I move that we adjourn as the Board of Commissioners of Longmont Urban Renewal Authority and reconvene as Longmont City Council. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item 12C, resolutions of the Longmont City Council approving an allotment contract and escrow agreement and two allotment transfer agreements for the Windy Gap Berming project. Do we have a, re a motion for resolution 2020-116? So moved. I'll second. second that. All right, it's been moved by Councilman Martin, second by Dr. Waters. All in favor of resolution 2020-16, a resolution of Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental allotment contract between the city of Longmont acting by and through its water utility enterprise and the Windy Gap Firming Project Water Activity Enterprise for capacity of the Windy Gap Firming Project. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed aye. say nay. That motion carries, Harold, unanimously. All right. Do we have a motion for resolution 2020-117? So moved. All right. I'll second that. So um, we have a motion for resolution 2020-117, a resolution of Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental escrow agreement between the city of Longmont acting by and through its water en utility enterprise, the Windy Gap Firming Project Water Activity Enterprise for the Windy Gap Firming Project. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, uh, that motion uh, passes unanimously. All right, item 12-3, resolution 2020-118, a resolution of Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and City of Loveland for the sale and purchase of Windy Gap Firming Project storage capacity. Do we have a motion? So moved. I'll second that. All right, any questions or debate on this? Didn't think so. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed aye. say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, resolution 2020-119, a resolution of Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and the City of Fort Lupton for the sale and purchase of Windy Gap Firming Project storage capacity. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Martin, seconded by Dr. Waters. All in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, now we've got some resolutions to Longmont City Council approving the Third Amendment, the redevelopment and reimbursement agreement, and partial assignment to 320 Granary Owner LLC for 210 Emory Street and consent to a development concept plan for 110 Emory Street. Taking it one at a time, do we have a motion for resolution 2020-120, a resolution to Longmont City Council consenting to the development concept plan for 110 Emory Street? So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Martin, seconded by Councilmember Peck. Any discussion on the matter before we vote? All right, seeing none, all in favor of resolution 2020-120, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, and then uh, next, resolution 2020-121, a resolution along with City Council approving the third amendment to the redevelopment and reimbursement agreement and partial ass assignment and assumption to 320 Granary Owner LLC for 210 Emory Street and 322nd Avenue. Do we have a motion? So no. moved. <laughs> All right, that was, it was moved by Dr. Waters and was it seconded by Councilmember Peck? No, Martin. Okay, it's so moved seconded by Councilmember Martin. All right. Mayor, uh, Tony yes. Saccone, All right. uh, redevelopment manager. Uh -huh. If you're interested, Brian Bagley, the developer of 150 Main, which is the South Main Station project. Brian Bear. You said Brian, Bear. Brian Bagley. I am not, I'm not developing crap. Brian Bear. <laughs> but yeah, I, I appreciate him being here. Anybody have any questions for the developer? Can we vote? Well, he he would he has a short presentation to give you an update on the status if you're interested. Yes. Well, all right. Well, if he wants to risk the nays, sure, go ahead and talk. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but but lesson is you always be quiet when you got the votes. But let's go ahead and hear what he has to say. Hope it's good. I'm happy to let you vote. Well, go ahead. Still wait. <laughs> All Council right. Member, Council Member Christensen, who wants to hear what we have to say. Yeah, no, real quick, wanted to do three things, uh, and I'll move quickly because I know it's getting late, but I think these will be valuable for you, and, and thank you for the, uh, giving me the time this evening. Um, this is all relevant to the TAP agreement, but I wanted to do a quick update on South Main Station for you, uh, talk also an update on the granary because these things are kind of all tied together, and then finish it with the the, the – uh, a few slides for the uh, for the site plan for 110 Emory, which is really the purpose of this uh, presentation. So I'm not sure who's driving the presentation, but if you could pull up my slides, that'd be great. And I'll fly through it pretty quick if you get advanced to the next slide. Uh, as you all know, these are the chunk, these are the pieces. Phase one is uh, 150 Main, where the red star is. Next slide, please. Um, quick update on leasing. We are actually, as of today, I think we just hit 70% leased. So uh, it's been pretty incredible during COVID uh, to get that kind of velocity. Really over the last four months, it's been very robust. I, there's some interesting demographic data here that I thought you might find interesting. 60% um, uh, of the tenants are under age 30, 15% uh, over age 50. Um, over a third of them are from Boulder County, 30% are out of the area. So uh, probably not what we would have predicted. Uh, and just very interesting information as you know, these new projects come into downtown. Uh, retail's 23% leased. We've got several LOIs that we're working through right now, which would be new, uh, new companies to downtown uh, in the sort of food and beverage and retail world. Next slide, please. Uh, building five, which is the last building. If you recall, we only built four out of the five buildings. We started building five, we're about 90% done with CDs. We'll be submitting that in January for a building permit. And we expect to start that building uh, probably in uh, April, May of uh, 2021. That'll be an additional 61 units and it'll finish the, finish the two blocks. Next slide, please. Uh, jumping over to the greenery where the red star is, I think you all know that building. Um, we were uh, really moving quickly on the rehab of the actual old greenery building. Then COVID hit and really, as you all know, really slowed down the whole uh, food and beverage world, not, not to mention the whole world. Um, 
We put that on hold, but we've actually brought that back. Next slide, please. Um, we've sort of flipped the strategy there. We were originally gonna do the greenery building, which is which you see in blue is now phase two. And then we were gonna do the multifamily, their townhome apartments in, in phase two. We flipped that and now we're uh, moving forward with the, our new phase one, which will be 20 uh, townhome style apartments. We've already completed our pre-app and we're anticipating a site plan submittal in January. So that'll really start to take that, that quarter block and uh, get that moving. The, as far as the granary, uh, as soon as the, you know, things start to, restrictions start to lift and, and some changes start to happen with COVID, uh, we will start to pursue that again. The last piece here is 110 Emory, which is where the Red Star is. That's the four acre piece that's directly east of phase one. Next slide, please. This will happen in two phases as well. Uh, many of you, you've been out to the site and I've, I've showed you around. There's a, uh, an old Butterball Spice building down at the south end of the, bill, of the property here. This is where they stored all the spices. It's about a 19,000 square foot uh, warehouse building. We're gonna actually rehab that building into an adaptive reuse. I'll show you what that's gonna look like. That's phase one, 19,000 square feet. We're hopefully about inside 30 days of final approvals with staff uh, on the site plan and the replat. We've already submitted for a building permit. So we're parallel tracking and we hope to start construction in December and deliver that building in March. And what's interesting about that building is it fits in with the steam project and everything else that's going on where we've got some maker space, we've got some service retail, we've got some office. So it'll really help to activate the daytime use um, in this area. Just north of that is the phase two property, which is roughly about three acres. We've got that laid out for 155 to 160 additional units, uh, multifamily units. These will be smaller apartments um, with a lower price point. Um, and it's a smaller project, so they won't be as amenitized as uh, South Main Station. But our view is this whole neighborhood is becoming an amenity. Um, and with everything we're doing, uh, are in the surrounding blocks. Uh, we think that this is gonna be a, a, another real popular place to live and a, and, a, and a nice development downtown. So that'll be uh, two four-story buildings with tuck under parking and there'll be some site parking. Uh, there'll be a corner amenity building up on 2nd and Emory. And um, uh, we anticipate that to start uh, uh, next year in terms of entitlements and construction for that building will start in 2022, right about when we finish building five of phase one. So this site plan here is really the, the crux of this presentation to show you what we're doing on the 110 Emory property uh, so that uh, we can move forward with the uh, approval of the TAP credits for this particular property. Please advance slide. A um, couple of slides here just showing you what the building looks like and how it breaks up. Next slide. Um, some, some rendering images. We're going to be sort of going in a sort of urban look, something from out of sort of uh, the Rhino District down in Denver. Next slide, please. Uh, same, same things here. So we're taking an old metal building, uh, sprucing it up, putting a lot of storefront and glass and windows in it uh, to make it more transparent, make it feel a little more retail, a little more active. Next slide, please. Um, here's uh, just a snapshot of the phase two with the apartments. Next slide. This is, uh, we're starting to elevate those units and bring them up so you can see it's a little more, uh, I would say a little more uh, modern looking than phase one. Um, and as I said, these will be slightly smaller units with a lower price point. Next slide. So in summary, um, 110 Emory is property five uh, in the TAP credit agreement. I'm sure you don't have that agreement in front of you, but I wanted to identify that. Uh, I'm, we're seeking concept plan, implementation plan approval from council uh, per section nine of that agreement, which is, a, is a, a process that we agreed to as part of the TAP agreement. Um, our plan is consistent with the first, uh, first in Maine 
uh, transit uh, redevelopment plan, which was one of the key things that, that had we had to qualify for. And it also meets the uh, downtown Longmont master plan. Um, so those two things we believe we meet. Um, and phase one, uh, this building, the warehouse building that I showed you, rehab will be done um, in April, May of 2021. And then we expect the phase two, which would be the 160 apartments to be done sometime in 2023. So that gives you an idea of, uh, of an update of where we are with South Main Station, a preview of what we're gonna be doing on the granary property and uh, what we're doing right now with 110 Emory. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, Councilmember Christensen. Ah, thank you, Mr. Bear. You've been uh, slogging away at this for a long time. Tell me about it. And I thank you for um, a lot of thoughtful design and a lot of varied design. And um, a lot of it's working out very, very well, I think. Um, I also want to thank you for um, putting in, I don't know what these are, the, um, the um, smaller apartments. There's a huge need for that in Longmont. That's huge. I don't know if these will be single room occupancy, like studio apartments, or if they'll be slightly larger than that, but um, that's what we really need. Nobody's been building that for a long time. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to thank you for that and uh, ask you about what the price point is for those single room units. It, are you talking about for the 110 Emory? Oh, yeah, the smaller apartments. Yeah, we, we haven't priced them yet, but they will be smaller square footage wise than South Main Station with a larger focus on studios and one bedrooms. Yeah, good. So what um, about what size would those uh, studios be? Um, I don't know what the studios would be exactly, but we're, we're targeting about a 700 square foot average across the whole project. Oh, that's pretty big as far as I'm concerned. Well, that, that includes the, 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 any two bedrooms that we might do all the way down to the studio. So to, to put that in, in, in perspective for you, at South Main Station, we're at, 100, we're at 862 average. Mm -hmm. This would be quite a bit smaller. Yeah. Well, thank you, because, you know, when this started, everybody's... I mean, you you know that this was a very difficult project. <laughs> you know better than anybody else, and yeah. difficult to finance, difficult to because of the the um, mitigation, the environmental mitigation you had to do. And but the whole idea was this would really be a game changer for Lower Downtown. I hope we can find something that uh, is equally. Um, as interesting for North Main, which has sort of gotten the short end of the stick in many ways in our development things. But I, I wanna thank you. I do think this will be a really uh, enormous addition to our town. Getting people to live downtown is, um, will change everything. So thank you for what you're doing. Appreciate that. All right, is there anyone opposed to the resolution? All right, hearing none, Let's go ahead and vote. I believe there was a motion made, correct? Who made that motion? Don? Mayor, Councilmember Waters made the motion. Marcia seconded. Okay. All in favor of resolution 2020-121, say aye. 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 I almost said nay just to, just to prove a point, but aye. All right. Motion carries unanimously. Anybody a nay? All right. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Um, let's go ahead and move on to... E, discussion regarding council members' roles and responsibilities as City of Longmont Advisory Board liaisons. Um, I put this on because uh, there's some question as to what are our roles as liaisons. Uh, as we all know that this is a council that I as mayor and each of us as city council people, we cannot act individually. It requires four of us. And so um, as a liaison, are we taking an action role or is it a communication role or is it a, I mean, what, what is our role? And so I think all of us have been behaving in different ways with different assumptions. And so uh, we're gonna talk about it. Who'd like to start? Councilmember Martin and we'll go with Dr. Waters. 
Yeah, and since this was Dr. Water's suggestion, I probably should have let him talk first, but I've been very quiet this evening. Um, so I'm going to talk. It, I have found that uh, the role of the council person uh, tends to vary a lot from one board to the next. So for example, the senior advisory board, which I have found to be both active and effective, uh, often has questions for me about um, what the council needs to hear in order to make changes um, or offer support. Um, they often um, are interested in, in uh, uh, information about what's going on between the city and the state legislature. They're often interested in, in um, oh, you know, CML type information. And um, so it's, it's, it really is a partnership where, you know, they're, they are looking to, to um, understand policy better so, so that they can turn it into um, actions that serve their special constituency. Um, in, in other, other boards like Art in Public Places, for example, I feel much more like an observer. You know, they have a very set um, plan of activity and they do that in a very organized way and they really don't need very much from the city council. Um, so, you know, there's a continuum. I think that, uh, that uh, we need to attend because I, I think part of our duties are to the council. Uh, I think that we should know if uh, an advisory board isn't working, isn't functioning right. And, um, and as council members, it may be our job um, to uh, take action in terms of city policy that might correct that. Dr. Waters? Yeah, Dr. Thanks, Dr. Dr. Waters, then Councilmember Peck. Um, personally, uh, I've just had a couple of experiences where it caused me to inquire about, do we have, do we have any guidance uh, in terms of what our, our responsibilities are? If, if, if I thought I was clear in the role, at least how I, what I do to fulfill the role uh, in the form of responsibilities. And, uh, and was surprised to, to learn, I should have asked this a long time ago, that there's virtually nothing in writing that guides council member activity, um, which seemed peculiar to me, especially since we went to some lengths uh, to create greater, to raise the expectations for applicants to boards and commissions to set some standards for attendance for them at boards and commissions uh, as applicants and as participants for boards and commissions um, that we had ne we'd never asked for feedback. And I see here that, the, that we would collect feedback for, so I, I have no idea whether or not what I'm doing, uh, how it varies from what others are doing and what you might be doing that would be more productive from which I can learn I mean, it's just a range of things and to model for boards and commissions what it is um, that we're expecting from them. So um, I, think it, I, think it, I think it would be helpful to have some guidance uh, and this will leave a lot of degrees of freedom, um, but does set some standards for, for what they can expect from us just as what we've done is set some standards in terms of what we can expect from them. Councilmember Peck. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, to Councilwoman Marsha's um, point, I agree with her in that uh, each board and commission is very different. And I have made a, a remark, perhaps it should have been in a, in a motion, that I think somewhere on this agenda, we should hear from a report from other council members as to what has been going on with their boards and commissions. And uh, because we don't know what each, how each one interacts or what it is they need or how we should interact with them. I also 
a couple of years ago made the motion that we have the Friday morning session specifically for board and commission uh, reports. So each one of us knows what's going on with the other board and commission, and we can see and judge how we are acting. And is this what we need? Do we need to act in a different way? Do we need different things from different commissions? So I, I don't think a resolution is the way to do it, mainly because a standard that is an umbrella for all boards and commissions, they're all different. We all have to have different, I would rather have a communication first about what each board and commission that we are liaisons for, what is going on with them, how we interact, what do they need, what is working and what is not, and then come up with as a council, uh, a format that can be, um, Changed. I don't like the idea that we would communicate with each other by email as to what our board or whatever is doing because there's no interaction there. It's just, it's just an email. But I, I firmly believe we need reports. I want to know what arts and public places are doing and not just from the minutes, but from the liaison. I want to know what, I, I would love to tell you what's going on with Dr. Cog with NADA with RTD, but there's no format for that. Um, and you know, some of the, the higher boards that I'm on, they have a place in the agenda where the boards that met the week before, their liaisons give a report. This is what's working, this isn't what's working. This board is not following the work plan of city council. Do we need to change it? Is it important that they do? Um, and I, I would rather have one-on-one -on -one than emails. So um, I won't vote for this, even though I do believe that we need to have interaction. And I have brought that up in the past on two different ways to do it. But I'm glad that we are going to have the discussion about it finally. Councilmember Christensen. Um, yes, yeah, I, I, um, I appreciate the, what uh, Councilwoman Martin said. I think that we've all observed that every single board is very different and our difference, uh, there, there is a huge difference in our um, responsibility if we are a voting member of something versus whether we are merely a liaison. A liaison is really not supposed to be, um, a, a liaison has no voting power or any other power, they're supposed to just communicate with each other. But as Councilwoman Peck has pointed out, she did ask for us to put something on the agenda uh, so that we had an opportunity of at every meeting of city council to um, comment on various things going on. When I see something that's going on uh, that I think is interesting as a city council, I try to mention it at the end of the night, but of course we're all pretty tired by the end of the night. Um, I do think we can certainly expect that council members will actually go to their meetings. And I do think that it would be useful to, um, if they miss more than two meetings without being, I mean, we hold the um, members of the advisory boards to the fact that if they have more than two unexcused absences that they can be voted off the board. I think, certainly think that would be a reasonable thing to expect of our city council members. And I, I believe that most of us do that. We go to the meetings and <laughs> so I don't really see a, a reason for this resolution because it, it, it it's kind of like babysitting us. You know, we really ought to know better than any of this. Anyway, I, things like um, check with the city council, the whole of city council to confirm council positions before representing council positions to assigned boards and commissions. I, um, these often come up when you're at the meeting and there's no way that you could consult with all the city council members to see what they think before you voice your opinion or, <laughs> I mean, no one thinks that we stand for every single thing 
uh, that as individuals, it's obvious to a board that we're expressing our individual opinion. If they ask me what I think that city council will um, say if they bring something forward, I don't speak, for instance, as a city, as whole, as being able to give them an opinion of what everybody on city council may, uh, might think. I try to imagine what city council, um, some of the questions they might have so they can be thinking about those before they bring something before us. Um, I, I don't think it's a good idea to invite anonymous feedback. We get in, people can give us anonymous, people can give us feedback all the time and they do already. We don't need to ask for more feedback. Um, so I, I, I still think it would be useful to have the Friday morning meeting, but what I thought it would be would be, uh, as I said, conf um, patterned after what Rick Fitzgerald does at the senior center. Everybody gets five minutes. That would be seven of us. So that would be 35 minutes. Then we can have a few more comments, then we can go home. But we could also, sorry, I'm looking for my son. Um, we could also just have that time, we could just have that time um, on the agenda where if people have something that they need to say um, to the whole of city council about something that's either coming up or something that has happened, we should take that opportunity because it is the only time we get to find out what people think. It's really nice that the city uh, portal right now has, uh, because of uh, Longmont Public Media, they have filming films of everything and they also have the agenda. It's very organized and people can check into this if they want. But frankly, I would rather have uh, the city liaison say, okay, I went to the Sustainability Advisory Board and these are the topics they discuss. There's nothing that really relates to city council right now. Or, you know, just, I went, nothing much was discussed. We have to be very careful too about, sometimes um, an advisory board is always um, advising about either a department or sometimes it's a, uh, private entity that we give money to. Um, we have to be very careful to respect their privacy and to respect the fact that what we say in public can have very bad repercussions on them. And so we don't want to, I just think we have a very, uh, We have to be very careful about what we say about our advisory board meetings, because sometimes people don't really want us to make things public. They want to, they feel like they can trust us to not um, explain all the difficulties they're having. Um, anyway, I, I don't think this, I'm glad that we brought this forward to discuss it. Um, I don't think this resolution hits the mark, but, um, and I disagree with some of the things said here, but I do think it's, I'm glad we discussed it. Okay, that's all I have to say. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, so just to echo a couple of things, I absolutely agree with the sentiment that not all boards and commissions are created equal in the sense that there's definitely some where we're actually voting members of. And I think that becomes an even larger impetus to make sure that you're attending those meetings, otherwise you're forfeiting a vote as, as a, you know, a council member uh, representing the council. For instance, in Visit Longmont, for instance, we are a vote there. Um, uh, then you have commissions such as planning and zoning and historic preservation, where it's actually probably inappropriate to interact too much with them, as oftentimes those things can appeal, be appealed to council. And so it's best sometimes just to simply observe. Um, 
I don't really have, going specifically to the resolution offered by Councilmember Waters, I don't specifically have any problems with the bulleted points listed. Uh, the only thing that, that concerns me is that if we make some of these requirements so standardized and, and to a certain extent a, a bit onerous for certain members in the sense that this could become a, a barrier to folks who would like to run for office for the city of Longmont, uh, as far as starting to dictate so specifically maybe absences from certain boards or, or attendance issues or, or certain things like that to the point where, you know, I know for, for me, for instance, sometimes it's difficult to attend certain meetings. Um, and that's just part of being a, a younger married person working full time and, you know, it, you know, life comes at you in different ways. Uh, throughout your life as, as you, you, you know, continue on the journey. And so my time requirements may not be the same. And like I said, I just worry about that becoming a barrier for other people wanting to run for office. So we make sure that we have the kind of diversity of, of uh, representation that the city really deserves. So that's my only problem with really specifying a lot of things. Like I said, I don't really have problems with the bolded points that were provided in the resolution because I think they were at, they, they provided enough leeway for uh, us as elected representatives of the community to have some sort of, um, you know, judgment as to whether we're really missing the mark or not. Uh, to be unseated because of liaison attendance issues doesn't seem like it would be appropriate for a city council member regardless. Um, outside of that, like I said, it, it seems like a, uh, pretty straightforward and logical things that we should be considering as liaisons. And those are just uh, my two cents on it. I'd, I know this is a discussion, so I don't think we necessarily need a motion. Um, so I'll be interested to see <laughs> any, any more opinions on this at this time. Councilmember Mayor Peck. It wasn't that important, no. Um, checking with all of city council before we take a position. You know, in Dr. Cog, we always have uh, positions on different bills that are coming before Senate, the state Senate or uh, legislature. And I, I have to abstain on most of them because we don't get those bills maybe a couple weeks to take a council vote on. Uh, after the Dr. Cog meeting. So it would be impossible to get council's uh, input on that. Um, and there are some things that I work very closely with uh, Phil Greenwald and uh, Tyler Stamey to get input on something that's coming on the agenda at Dr. Cog or NADA. And they advise me on how we should vote for the city. So, um, some of these just don't work on, on all of our uh, boards and commissions. It isn't that I don't think we should uh, not uh, communicate. I don't like the word correspond because that leaves out any one-on-one uh, -on -one talking or telephone calls. Uh, communicate would be a better word for me in that. Um, I, I would love to communicate what we're doing on some of those boards. We just don't have the agenda to do it. We don't have the platform. And that's what I would like to, to see happen. And after we learn what the liaisons are saying about their different boards, then perhaps we can, at that point, come up with, uh, with some points that, that all liaisons should always follow. But, but I think they're gonna be very general. I can't see how they can be specific. Uh, let's go Dr. Waters. Yeah, I just, um, <clears throat> for me, I, I, I run in, as I said, there were some experiences that provoked me to, to wonder about, do we have any guidelines? Um, and I, and I, maybe I'm the only one, I suspect I'm not, uh, on the only member of the council, uh, who from time to time is in, interacting with somebody who's a member of a board of commission. 
and I'm wondering, why are you talking to me? And the answer is because the person who's assigned to my, my, my board of commission, the council member, doesn't show up. And I'd like somebody, you know, to hear what my concerns are. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but I don't know what to do with that. Um, other than to say, I, you know, you go talk to that person. Uh, I, I have had, I have had the experience of a uh, puzzling um, over, and I'm not, this is not uh, council member Peck, when you're voting on a, on a commission, it is when a board member of this council represents to a board of commission, a position of the council that I scratch my head and think, where'd that position come from? Because that's not the position that I think we took. It's a, it's a, it's a surprise to me um, because I think it's not an accurate portrayal. And it would have been a matter of courtesy, if nothing else, for that council member to have checked with the rest of us to say, I just want to confirm, this is the position that we're, that we're representing to, this, to the city or to this board of commissioners or anybody. Um, so, I, when I run into those things, um, I, there's nothing to turn to the, in terms of guidance for me or for anybody else. Um, and I, in, in absence, anything that we could point people to, I guess we could come to these sessions and, and then talk about them as one-offs. I've had this experience last week, um, you know, and if, it, if it's me, then I'd want to hear about it. And if this is the only time to hear about it, then I'd want to hear about it. But but to ignore them, I think is irresponsible, um, which is what is happening now. And for us to set a higher standard for, the, for members of boards and commissions than we would apply to ourselves, I also think is irresponsible. So this not, may not be the right set of, of, re, of, of um, responsibilities for fulfilling the role, but to not wanna hear that I, the council members Christensen about not, you know, wanting to hear anonymous feedback, that's, that's how we evaluate, that's how we get evaluative feedback from folks, is to say, you don't have to put your name on it, tell us what's working and what's not. And to say that we're not interested in that feedback, again, I think is irresponsible. So, you know, we can walk away from it, but, um, but, I'm, but, if, but I don't know what else to do then when I run into it, is except to bring it to a council meeting and say, okay, here was the problem that I heard last week, um, how do we go about solving it, whether it's me or any other member of council? Uh, Councilmember Martin, and we'll go with Councilmember Christensen. Yeah, I think that to, to adopt this resolution, we would need to, um, I'm sorry, I'm having cat problems here. Um, we, would, we would need to um, uh, do something different Marsha, you disappeared. I know, I'm back. Um, the, uh, a little derailed, sorry. Um, I, I think that the idea of, of communicating individually with, with council members to make sure that a, a potential representation of the council's position is not the right way to go about this. In fact, it, it might be uh, construed as making policy outside of the public meeting uh, if we did that. Um, in, in a couple of my boards, I do get asked questions like that. And my usual example, usual answer is, I don't believe council has taken a position on that. I mean, obviously, you know, in many cases, the council has taken a position on it and I know what it is, but otherwise the answer is the council hasn't taken a position and the role of the an advisory board is to offer advice. You know, it would help us, it would help the senior population if council took this position, if council funded, um, uh, you know, back in the old days, uh, uh, via services to get people to council meetings, for example, um, was, was uh, one policy that the senior advisory board um, offered as advice to the council. Um, so uh, 
I, I do have I, I do have a disagreement with that. Um, I think we do need in my my complaint about most of the internal advisory boards is that they um, don't offer enough advice to the council, and I would I would like it if they were more active uh, in in that respect. Some of them um, are more discussion groups that never yields anything up to council. Um, and while it's fine to have discussion groups, um, they're not really fulfilling their, uh, their charter um, by only doing that. Um, but then that comes back around to, it's a standard for the board and not for the liaison. I'd have to give more thought to what we do about that. All right, and we're going to go with Councilmember Christensen, and then I'm going to cut off discussion unless there's a motion. Go ahead, Councilmember Christensen. Um, yeah, I appreciate what Councilwoman Martin said about this. I, I do think that um, you know the original purpose of advisory boards was to give the public at large, any member of the public, a voice in local government and to help them understand local government. Um, we have now, um, it is true, we have changed, uh, we have preferenced people with higher uh, education and um, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. We have made it intimidating for anyone who does not have a college education or who is not upper middle class to be on these boards. I also do think that as Councilman Martin said that people are not, they don't understand that they actually are an advisory board and they should come up with ideas and we'll listen to them. I, I've observed over my last seven years that people are very intimidated by city council and they feel like, I mean, the whole their whole job, which they volunteered for, is to advise us about how well a certain department or um, sometimes a certain entity is working and what is needed between city council and those entities. And yet they feel as, as Councilman Martin said, they feel like an, a, they're supposed to just be a discussion group. And there's nothing really wrong with that. Um, uh, you have to educate yourself uh, anyway. I mean, it, with the Sustainability Advisory Board, there are lots of different people come in and speak and um, it's very educational. We learn about a lot of different things, very, a very broad array of things, which is really interesting. It, the difference between these, all these boards and commissions and things is so vast that I don't think we can come up with standards and predictability and um, all of us are different. And yet all of us on this board are equal. We were all elected by the people of Longmont to represent them. Um, and if people don't trust members of this council, then I mean, if our own council members call each other irresponsible, I don't think that's uh, very helpful at all. As far as getting seeking anonymous feedback, we don't allow people to write us anonymously. That's why I think it's a ridiculous idea. It, it leads, anonymous messages and communications lead to people saying things that they would never have the courage uh, to say publicly because they know they can get away with it because they're being anonymous. So I had take great um, um, umbrage at I, the idea of anonymous feedback because we don't allow that in any communications with staff count with council right now. And there's a reason for that. Um, I also think there's a huge difference between when I go to um, a typical advisory board is like seven members and me. Um, and I have no, if I'm a liaison, I have no um, voting power, as I said, well, none of us do. And there's a difference between that and something like um, council, Councilman uh, Rodriguez serves on the Planning and Zoning Board. That's very powerful. Uh, 
and he gets a boat, but no, you don't get a boat? Oh, I thought you did. All right. Marsha Martin gets a vote on LEDP, don't you? No? Hmm, okay. Anyway, some of these, <laughs> these the, the problem is that when you have a vote and you're one of, say, with uh, Colorado Municipal League, there are probably 150 people there. And you get the, um, agenda two days beforehand and it's constantly changing until an hour before the meeting. I sit down with Sandy Cedar because I'm representing not city council, I am representing this municipality and many times the municipal and Sandy and the entirety of staff have already discussed these issues and come to some conclusion along with Harold of course and and that's what they want me to represent. The Colorado Municipal League represents municipalities against the county, against the state. It's often against what I would choose as either an individual or as a member of this council. But what I'm supposed to be doing there is representing the city of Longmont. The, staff and administration of the city of Longmont. And I'm doing that as a city council member and it puts me in a lot of very difficult positions, but it's not something that I am, I am, I always vote the way that um, the staff and, uh, and the city administrator want me to vote because that's my job to represent the city of Longmont. I do that after spending a couple of hours talking with Sandy. Um, so it's not, it, it, that's a totally different role from uh, when you're sitting down with 150 people <laughs> or more. Um, that's a different situation. And I don't, as far as having predictability and um, consistency, we all like predictability and consistency, but I, I don't think that's really uh, something we should have a fetish about with <laughs> boards and commissions. So I won't be voting for a resolution, but I think we should keep talking about this and figuring out a venue for us to have some kind of consistent comments, uh, some consistent time when we can comment about these, because I would like to hear what everybody else is doing. I guess I would just, I just, I just, I just, just, just type in, I would just ask that if you're not a voting member of the board, um, I don't care what you do, just make sure that when you're expressing an opinion, when it pertains to me, just make sure that you're actually expressing my true opinion. If you don't like it, I don't care, just get it right. And uh, many times I hear from other boards that, uh, oh, so-and-so said the mayor, and it's just wrong. So I have no problem with people disagreeing with me or criticizing me just so long as it's factually correct. So anyway, Dr. Waters, if you want to say something else, that's fine, but- Yeah, I'm going to make just one more comment and, I, and, and, I, and, and I'll let it go and I won't make a motion. Uh, it's clear where, where this would end up. But I did hear uh, council member Christensen make a reference to this council intimidating members of boards and commissions, her words. Um, uh, and then not wanting in, uh, any anonymous feedback from boards and commissions. And people who might be intimidated by a board or commission like this, the one way we might get some honest, uh, candidly helpful feedback would be for them to not have to put their name on it if they're already intimidated. That would be the whole purpose of gathering some anonymous feedback for the purpose of us getting better at what we do. Um, I've heard council member Christensen make reference to, we don't get better without data. Those that see there's the kind of data, not the only data, but the kind of data that, that people like us should be able to use to improve our performance. Uh, whatever the comments are, uh, yeah, my, the concerns, a, a fear of somebody saying something that's offensive, I, it's, I, it's hard for me to imagine if we structured a way to get feedback, we get a lot of offensive feedback. Uh, comments, offensive feedback, but we might get some comments 
that it would help us sharpen what we do that adds value to what they do. So I'll let it go. All right, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Um, meaning that concludes our session on, on liaisons. How about we all just do the best we can and we'll go nuts. All right, Mary Patel, why don't you say something else? <laughs> Thank you, I'd just like to move that the meeting proceed past 11 o'clock if necessary. A uh, second, anybody opposed? All right, consensus, we're gonna go past 11. All right, um, let's go ahead and just briefly, let's fly through this, uh, discuss and establish 2021 city council meeting schedule. I guess, my, Harold, I guess in the future, I guess it doesn't really matter, I won't be around. So anyway, go ahead, let's go ahead and go through the schedule. And basically it's, we, it's, it's always the same every year. If it's, if it's a week, it's election or holiday, we take it off, make sure we get two regular session meetings in there and fill in the rest of study sessions, shoot for four month, but um, let's do what we always do. Thank you, Mayor. I think we can work pretty quickly through. There's just a couple of times um, where we okay. do want, would like some direction. So I'm assuming you all are looking at this draft schedule that I have got. So January 2021 would be two uh, regular sessions on the second and fourth Tuesday, a study session on the first Tuesday on the fifth. The question is, would you like us to replace the second study session with an open forum? Yes. And if it's virtual. So last yeah. time you, we postponed. Yes is the answer. I believe everyone's going to say yes to that one. Okay. Um, and then an overarching question is, would you like us to um, begin again with coffees with council in January, even if they're virtual? Yes. Okay. So January is done. February is a pretty regular month. Study regular, study regular. No questions there. So I'll just keep going. In March, um, there is a possible NLC Congressional Cities Conference. Uh, a lot of council seem, or some council when they go fly out on that Tuesday. So the question is, um cancel that tuesday we always cancel do. tuesday the 9th so, by the way i'm just going to say it and speak up if somebody disagrees i'm just going off the what we've done for the last nine years so yeah okay. cancel the lot ninth. cancel the ninth. that means we'll make the the 16th the regular session mm -hmm. would you like to cancel the meeting the week of spring break st saint brain's spring break what, what day is that what week? the 23rd march 23rd it's two in a row guys yes all right yes um, can I break in for a minute? Yeah, go ahead, Joan. Since that is two in a row, can we hold off on the NLC in case that is virtual? It or will be. Or, uh, in case we can't fly? And then maybe we don't have to uh, uh, yeah, yeah. do two good, in a row? Good idea. Let's hold off. So we we'll, will we'll keep can, the... it, Cancel it if it's, if it's in person. Don't cancel if it's virtual. Okay, so um, then a regular, we'll see what happens with that, that conference. Cancel the week of spring break. Yeah. And then the 30th will depend on how the 9th and 16th pan out. Uh, Is that okay? Why? Um, because potentially we'll need a second regular session two weeks apart from the other. Correct. Okay. April is standard, study regular, study regular. No questions there. And we'll just keep coffee with council on the fourth Saturday as we've done. Uh, May, study regular, study regular. May the fourth, okay. really? We're not taking the, May the fourth off? May the fourth uh, be with you, Mayor. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> In June, um, we would do a study regular. Uh, if we've kept your pattern, we'd make an open forum on the 15th instead of a study session. June 15th, would you like Should us we, to do that? I also think we should get rid of the 29th if we, I mean, for, for the council, I, I, we've canceled the fifth meeting in the past. Anybody opposed to that? The question would be the week of the 22nd is possibly CML. And generally you cancel that one for CML. One then. And then the 29th, June 29th becomes a regular session. Right. So four meetings, but a five Tuesday month. Right. July. Would you like to cancel the study session the day after Independence Day? So July 6th yeah. or hold that meeting? That's not the day after, that's- uh, The second day after, sorry, yes. But the holiday celebrated is Monday the 5th. I, I'd like to cancel it, but what do you guys think? 
Anybody opposed to canceling July 4th? All right, we'll go July ahead and 6th, cancel it. Sorry. That's okay. what I mean, the 6th, okay? And then uh, the 13th would be regular, the 20th a study, the 27th a regular. Mm -hmm. Moving to August um, would be normal, study regular, study regular. Cancel the 31st. Cancel the 31st, unless you'd like to also cancel um, the day after Labor Day in the following month, then it, maybe we hold that in case budget would like it. Matt, well, Labor Day is the what, 6th? The 6th, yes. I say we do the 7th, cancel the 7th. What do you guys think? Cancel the day after Labor Day? Mm -hmm. And then keep the 31st if needed? Yep. Okay, the 31st of August, okay. Then the rest of September is uh, normal. The 14th would be a regular, the 21st a study, the 28th a regular. October is absolutely regular, study, regular, study, regular. I'm holding these sheets up for you. Apparently, I think you can see these, sorry. <laughs> November, the first Tuesday is election day and it is a, a council election year. So I would assume you'd like to cancel that one. Oh yeah, cancel that one. <laughs> You're gonna celebrate, Mayor. <laughs> uh, regular on the 9th, a study on the 16th. And then the question is, would you like to cancel the 23rd for Thanksgiving week? Yep. And make the 30th a regular? Yep. We're almost done. December. So December, there's a couple. I did two options. One would be just do your normal schedule, study regular, cancel study it, regular. Cancel the 28th week of Christmas. Can we New just Year's. cancel December, period? Cancel you December. Know, actually, yeah. Some of us, depending on what we decide to do, don't care. But let's cancel the 28th. So we could um, do a... Regular study regular, if you wanted to hold the meeting on the 21st, or if you did the same you did this year, two regular sessions on the 7th and 14th, and then cancel the last let's, two weeks. Let's can, let's let's hold the 22nd in case we need it, but can, cancel the last two, have a 22nd meeting if we need it. 21st? I'm sorry, the 21st, yeah. So cancel the 28th for sure. Okay. And you you want to meet on the twenty first? I guess I'm. Or am I getting my dates wrong? December twenty twenty one. Tuesday is just twenty first. Uh, maybe is, my calendar got jacked up, but I'm showing the twenty second of Tuesday. Is it not? Well, I relied on this calendar I downloaded, Mayor. In the wrong year, Mr. Mayor. I don't think so. I'm looking, I mean, January 1st, 2021 is a Friday. And so the December before that. No, my phone, it's the same as well, Mayor. Sorry, Google, cal Google Calendar showing me Tuesday, December 21st. All right. Well, then I'm just going to assume it's the wrong year. But yeah, the last two weeks, cancel. So we will go regular, regular, back to back, and then cancel to get your two regular sessions yeah. in. Okay. We will, uh, I'll throw this back in cleaned up. Uh, so you can look at it as an information item so that everybody has that clean copy. Thank you. Yep. All right, great. Okay, let's move on to mayor and council comments. Any council comments? Councilmember Christensen? Um, well, tomorrow is Veterans Day and we won't get to have a parade and that's really sorry about that, but I hope all the veterans out there know how much everyone uh, appreciates their service. So thank you. All right, I don't see anybody else. What I would like to say is just, uh, um, I'm an unaffiliated former Republican and uh, as mayor of a small town in, in Longmont, Colorado, I just wanna stress how important it is that uh, we continue to recognize and uh, and uh, support our democratic process for selecting presidents and other elected leaders. And uh, I know I'm just a mayor in Longmont, but I'd like to congratulate President-elect Biden for his victory. And I would encourage our current president to accept the apparent will of the people. And I know my comments are gonna upset a lot of people, a lot of my friends, but um, it was a close election, it was hard fought, but in our country, when you lose, you concede. And there is no, even if, even if there were 
sporadic instances of voter fraud, which there may very well have been, you legally cannot overturn an election based on individuals acting alone. Without evidence, you have no case. And uh, without, uh, and I, I would just not only congratulate uh, President-elect Biden, but would admonish our current president to concede, move on, and let what has happened continue to happen. A transition of presidential power so that we don't get stuck in a situation where we're confused and hurting. So congratulations, President-elect Biden. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley, for those comments. I echo them, but I also am very proud to be an American, to be live in the United States, because it is one of the few places where we can turn our government in a peaceful, democratic manner without a coup, without and have everybody's voices heard. And I think that is a that is a privilege, and we should never forget that that we are very fortunate to have the opportunity to voice our opinion. So thank you very much. Anybody else? Councilmember Martin? Yes, uh, I'd also like to commend you, Mr. Mayor, um, for very well chosen words. Um, I concur. Uh, and I think in the coming year, um, I would like us all to work on having a consensus of fact, if not a consensus of opinion, because um, it, it's been frightening to me uh, to watch people argue about what the state of the election is based on completely inconsistent premises, um, if you will, separate sets of facts. Um, we have, um, research and, and news outlets such as the Associated Press in this country that um, are nonpartisan and indisputably uh, trustworthy. And I, I hope that all of the American public will remember that. All right, anyone else? All right, that concludes mayor and council comments. City manager remarks? No comments, mayor and council. All right, Eugene May, city no attorney. Comments here, mayor. Beautiful. All right, guys, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, that's a nay. So uh, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's not a nay, that's a big eye. We're out of here, it's late. All right, guys, I'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.